As a leader of an investigative team, I have learned that professionalism, communication, diplomatic approaches, and sometimes energy drinks are very important to stay afloat in this field. The field of paranormal has spread rapidly in recent years. This has given birth to additional controversies. There has been an introduction of some great new and legit people in this field. However, it seems that paranormal drama and some misconceptions are spreading about this field and some of the people and teams in it. It has made me think about the past and the pioneers to the present of what we do to the future of where we will be. Will the actions and misguidance of a few be contained? Or will it spread, contaminating this field for the next generation of paranormal investigators? Should there be a certificate issued by the local, state, or federal government to regulate teams? Keeping them legitimate and honest. Come out, you little bastards. Oh, what the fuck was that? I have investigated on three other teams before leading my own in nearly a decade of paranormal research. And those who have been in the field even longer have and can run into controversy from outside and inside of this field. Let's start investigating the general public's perception of the metaphysical world. Okay, well, we thought it would be neat to go ahead and collect the thoughts of the average Joe, average Jane out on the street, you know, those that might not have any affiliation with the paranormal. Definitely thought it was a good idea to get out and get the opinions of the common population. The simple fact is so many people today have different ideas and opinions on it. Yeah, that and get the general feedback of what people might think of researchers like ourselves and our colleagues and friends of ours and see kind of where the mass media may have uh, put their thoughts or placed their visions these days. Mm -hmm. So my fellow investigator and I went out separately and see how much media in Hollywood may have corrupted some perceptions. So, any paranormal experiences? So have you had a paranormal experience or been to any yeah. haunted areas? I did have one that um, it was the day after a funeral and someone asked me about that funeral and as I answered I felt an arm around me and I could not explain it it was just uh, for maybe five to ten seconds and then it was gone. I have not had any experiences myself but I do remember uh, something my cousin told me about that happened to her she was on an airline uh, traveling over the Pacific, heading towards Australia, and the side of the plane blew out. Uh, several rows of seats dropped into the ocean. She was sitting on the first row that did not drop out, and she said she saw a giant hand reach out, hold the plane up until they could land in Hawaii. And she said that was quite an experience. I had many experiences. Uh, I had um, this one house that we lived in was really haunted. There were a ton of stories that I had confirmed myself just as a little kid. And I would actually have this older lady that would take care of me when I was sick and would like sit by my bedside. Uh, yes. Um, actually, there's been quite a few. My first actual paranormal experience was um, when I was younger. We, me and my sister and my parents actually had a spirit that lived with us. Um, we knew his name because he was the spirit of one of my dad's friends that had passed away when he was younger. His name was Keith. Um, he would walk around the house. You could see him up and down the stairs at night. When I was about, I want to say about 13, I was, uh, we were staying at my cousin's house and she had warned us ahead of time that um, there had been some strange stuff going on and uh, it was me and my mom on the couch and the next thing I know my mom is jumping up 
screaming her head off and running down the hallway. <laughs> um, and there was a black figure in the, the doorway. She uh, did hold the stewardess, keep her from falling out the hole, so she felt good about that, that she kept the stewardess from falling out. I have always been feeling energy, like the house just down the street, my old house, Short Street, I became very good friends with the person who made it. So have you had a paranormal experience or been anywhere that's haunted? Yes, I've had quite a few paranormal experiences and I've been to a couple places that, that have been haunted. I've actually been taken over by a spirit before. And then just things just started falling off the counters. And from there, me and my mom left. She picked me up and yeah, we were out of there. He actually saved my little sister one time. Um, my little sister was maybe six or seven months old. She was still a baby and me and her shared a room. I was dead asleep and my mom and dad were in their room sleeping. Well, about halfway through the night, a picture of my little sister fell off a shelf above my mom and dad's bed and hit my dad in the head. And my dad woke up and saw the picture and got a really bad feeling in his gut and went to check on my sister and found that she had stopped breathing in the night. And my dad says that Keith saved my little sister. Um, I've been to a few cemeteries at night, but I haven't snuck in anywhere. And the only time that I went to a graveyard at night, I was actually eating with people. So in other words, you weren't really going there for the purposes that most people go for. Yeah, I was just going because it was somewhere and didn't want to go to anyone's house to eat and just, hey, a graveyard. I wouldn't say I'm a strong believer, but I, I feel there's something to it. Well, coming from my father, who tries to push religion on me quite a bit, um, he doesn't believe that ghosts exist, and I grew up with that mindset, but seeing things, I'm starting to have somewhat of a different view on that. I do believe ghosts are real. I am definitely a believer. That being said, do you think that the media has over-dramatized and put a bad lighting on paranormal? may mislead. I do believe that a lot of them have over-dramatized it. I do know that there are a few still out there on TV that still don't take it as bad as... I'm not going to name names, but... Um, I, I do feel that they focus more on the negatives. They don't really seem to see any ghosts that um, are positive. They, they do focus on the negative quite a bit. I see a lot in the media that people in the paranormal have kind of been dubbed as dark people which I don't see any of that as being true. Mm -hmm. I see um, people in the paranormal um, very outgoing, very ambitious, trying to find out really what's going on. But the media does portray the ghost aspect as to be more demons than anything else. Like if they're just a passive ghost who just happened to be there occupying space, then... or a positive ghost which I have yet to see, <laughs> but... Casper? <laughs> yeah, Casper, but... The media doesn't show the whole story, because, um, like, when I was at the Stanley Hotel, um, and it was, like, one of those, you know, fan things, that, um, they were actually, the ghost hunters were actually telling us, you know, like, some of the stuff behind the scenes, and so... Um, I think that the TV shows and the movies that show ghosts are very glorified and like it's I don't, I don't really know how to put it but I don't I don't think that they should be showing that kind of thing on TV especially to the younger generations because they're just gonna grow up thinking that that's the way that it is and I've heard that it's not uh, yes I think probably so but although I do feel that there are happenings too that are real but the media I think yeah has has over dramatized it a lot <laughs> it could potentially be bad. I do, a lot, because a lot of the um, ghost shows that are out there now, the um, the way that they, how would you put it, like, make it look, like, they glam it, like, glamorize it to the point where they can go to any place and find absolutely anything, and then when they do find it, they sit there and scream, or they yell, or 
they sit there and they egg it on. You feel that you're more um, maybe knowledgeable of potential consequences mm -hmm. than, let's say, average people your age? Yeah, probably. I am a believer. I've been taught my whole life that to embrace what I am and to learn from my mistakes and my advancements in this field. Totally a believer, yes. Um, the things that I've seen, the things that I've witnessed, there's no way. I'm a believer personally. Um, Fair enough. You think some of it's staged maybe for ratings? I think it almost have to be um, because it just seems unless they put together 10 years of work into one, you know, five show series, I don't see that they could get that much material. So, everything being said, do you believe that groups such as Paranormal Endeavors or any other group, do you believe that it's a good idea for groups to be out investigating and digging deeper into things, or do you think it's something that really shouldn't be messed with? I believe that so at one point there's going to have to be a break because, I mean, everyone's going to lose interest in it and everybody's going to start, because like the media, they're going to start faking evidence because they're going to keep trying to get people and people are going to believe that. Well, I think it's interesting and I think you, people always try and seek out answers for things they don't understand completely, but um, um, I don't know, what was the first part of that question? <laughs> There's some places that have been investigated quite a bit, and um, but I think it's still good. I mean, there's still stuff out there. I think it's okay to investigate, but I think Pearson should be careful and not um, provoke. Provoke, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they can't hurt you, and they will if if the need arises. I think uh, as teams, a lot of them have a good intentions to it. Most teams go out there just to try to find answers, try to find um, evidence of, you know, life beyond death. But I also think that a lot of people take it to extremes over much. As far as going in and trying to reason with the spirits, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't quite understand how you could reason with a spirit, but like looking for demonic entities and then provoking, which provoking is very negative in my opinion you don't want to ever start anything it, get, it does get you know some negative energy after a while with all the people going through it people going out and investigating just for answers you know i don't see that in any problem at all i see it as a great learning opportunity for the whole world some events should be left alone some should be investigated because once you get in there and you start riling those things up it that's what's gonna get people hurt. Don't think that everything that you see in Hollywood and on TV is completely true because if you do that, then you're going to get, well, you're going to ruin yourself. And if you know how to do it and you're versed in it and you're trained in it and you're very professional and you know how to handle yourself, that's when I feel that it's okay to do certain jobs. That concludes this on camera interview Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, thank you both for your time. Thank you. It's a very important message, I feel. It's a mission to help explore this stuff, but through your voices. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And of course, we wanted to touch on the reality of it with the folks on the front line. My name is Seth Olney. My name is Jesse Olney. My name is Justin Kasner. Our team is uh, Calhoun County Paranormal Investigators. Myself and my brother Jesse started back in started back in 2005. My name is Johnny Hauser. Um, I'm with Everyday Paranormal. Hi, I'm Dave Milby with uh, Central Iowa Ghost Society. Um, a lot of my friends call me Milber. Um, our team had just started up here um, first part of March of 2013. My name is Mike Sutton, and I started Central Iowa Paranormal Investigators in 2010. I'm Darcy McGrath. I'm the founder of Quantum Psy Group. I'm a paranormal researcher. I've been in the field and studying for 30 years. Um, my, uh, when we entered, it was back in 2001. It was actually an experience uh, Jesse had, and after he told me about it, I was instantly intrigued, 
and him and I both delved headfirst into uh, trying to find and dig up what we could about it. Um, I was brought up in a private Baptist church school, taught, you know, do not believe in ghosts. But one of the first houses we lived in, I'm talking shadow figures to door slamming to footsteps, we ended up moving because of it, and the next house we went to, it was ten times as bad. I got yanked out of a bed, just, you know, a lot of questions I had, is this real? Have you or your team encountered anything like that you consider dangerous or evil on that side? How do you feel about this being glorified? I have experienced uh, more of an evil, darker presence one time um, at a place that was known to have satanic rituals happen in it. I went down into the basement to where there used to be a pentagram where they did all this stuff, and I thought, I'll just try some religious provocation. So I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to show yourself to me. Right then I felt like a burn on the back of my leg and the hair was actually singed off. And you could smell the burnt hair, you could see the, the white tips and the curled hairs. I find it a, str a frustrating struggle that people are replacing what they see on TV and using that as their main basis for going out and dealing with the paranormal. There's a lot of uh, uh, pieces of information that are completely being left out of what's on TV simply because producers don't find it entertaining. I always, you know, the idea of demons and evil is almost a romantic idea. I was at Edinburgh Manor last year, uh, last August. I've had one encounter with what I would consider an evil force or a demon. Um, and I use that very loosely because I, I believe it's something that um, people without the right mindset and, and training and knowledge shouldn't dive into. Um, it was at the Velisca Axe Murder House. It was actually in the bottom cellar of it. And uh, basically I was down there and had previously had some feelings of anger, which is what made me leave. And I was like, I'm just gonna go back, see what happens, see if I can feel that again. And I went back down there and had a strange experience where a dark mass came out of the wall and smoke began to swirl around my legs and kind of climb up my body. And a white face in a black cloak slithered up my side as the smoke got higher and higher and higher. And my hands kind of wrapped to my side. My eyes kind of felt like they were gonna start rolling into the back of my head. Um, luckily, I had a strong enough mindset at the time to kind of sense that and rush out of there. And at roughly 3.30 in the morning, um, I hear something behind me. I'm upstairs alone. And it sounds like almost like a cat walking, like the claws on the floor um, or nails on the floor. And it kept getting louder and louder and closer and closer to me. You know, it's almost like a badge of honor. Oh, I fought a demon, this and that. But when you actually step into a place and feel it and see it, I mean, it's nothing cool. It's nothing to laugh about. I've seen a shadow run across the hallway from room to room, um, real faint. Um, after that, I could hear the noise getting closer. And I had a really, really bad feeling that I needed to get out of that situation. And I had actually taken off running down the hallway and I could hear it getting louder behind me like it was starting to chase me. Along with the, you know, the movies, the, the, the stuff in the media about evil paranormal and, and this and that, you know, it's just a thought, an idea um, that the producers and they're more like entertainment. Granted, some teams are on national television that show you the facts. You know, TV is TV. They really want to push the limits and they want it to be exciting. So instead of going after a ghost, you're going after a demon, you might get possessed. And I, I really think it's extremely overdone. Um, and how I feel about it being glorified in, in today's media, I think it's, it's ridiculous because you're dealing with forces that do have the potential of over, overcoming your entire mindset and making you do things that you're not capable of actually um, wanting to do yourself opening people up to, to avenues that they should not be opened up to, like I said, without proper knowledge or training of that. And I, I just think it's, it's ridiculous. In reality, how many times has, in the cases you've had, um, things thrown, people get overtaken by spirits, people levitating, people, you know, running out screaming. Very rarely. It's a, it's a very rare occurrence to have that actually happen. That's, and a lot of times I have to correct people when they watch shows like Paranormal Activity and some of those that that's Hollywood. They're augmenting it for entertainment value. You know, where you're finding a demon every week, whereas the Catholic Church takes sometimes 20 years to 
been something really demonic. Because of what's seen on TV and shows and all that, um, too many people jump to conclusions. Now everybody that gets a little scratch or something, instantly there's a demon, and I think that can lead to something really bad, especially with clients and houses. If you get scratched in the house, you go off and tell those clients, you have a demon in your house, it can get really bad really fast. And it could have just been something simple, someone trying to get your attention. I think they overdo it somewhat. Um, it's a lot different, I believe, if you experience it yourself. Um, obviously, they, they show things that are fake, and they, they just overdo it. All right, does your team then work with psychics or the spiritual side at all, or is it strictly science-based, and why? And we actually did, uh, we thought, well, let's put psychics to the test. We went to a ghost town in Texas, and we put on Craigslist, if you're psychic or have psychic abilities, meet us at this place tomorrow. Our team is going to be focused mostly on the facts and uh, more evidence reveal um, and, and, and so much of the spiritual side of things. There is one or two of our team members that, you know, have this, what you would call sixth sense. Um, we're not going into the investigation with that focus in mind. And we said, okay, if you're psychic, do your thing. And the, you know, we had three different people. Two went in there and one failed miserably. The other nailed stuff that we were talking about earlier that day, which nobody knows. The other was from Nashville, Tennessee, and she was doing it remote and nailing stuff. So that really changed my mind on psychics forever. You know, I always thought it was parlor tricks or leading questions, but. There are also a lot of people that have sensitivities that don't realize that they're having them until you actually go through the interview process and, oh, well, the house they lived in when they were born was very, very active. And, oh, well, then there was that house in, in uh, Anamosa and, oh, the dorm I was lived in in college is absolutely crazy. You start uh, situating and making a pattern of experience and they suddenly realize, oh, I've had this my entire life. Being in the paranormal field, being on the road, traveling and whatnot, and some of the forces at hand, do you feel there's been any times where it's made it hard for relationships, whether it's friends or personal, intimate ones? Um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we have, Seth and I have family that have kind of pushed us into the background and really want nothing to do with us because of the things that we deal with. And granted, we, we don't go to investigations and, and haunted locations looking for these evil things. We, we go for the paranormal. So not only does that impact them, but that impacts us in a way too, because it's hurtful. And we we feel led to do this. We, we think that it's something we're supposed to be doing. It's a passion of ours. And when it leads to things like that, it, it, it does suck. I myself have a fiance right now, and uh, she it, it has kind of impacted a little bit of our relationship to the point that I'm always going to events or locations and everything to where she doesn't feel like I'm at home enough. but. You know, it, it's that anybody in that kind of situation has to realize that if you're passionate enough for this and you really want this to be a part of who you are, that you just have to make those kind of sacrifices and who you're with has to understand that as well. All right, now in hindsight, anything that you've done in the past that you maybe wouldn't do again? I did push it a little far um, at the Randleman house only because I was, I knew something was there and I was trying to get it to prove that it was there. and. I think by doing that, it, it may have stirred up some activity. I wasn't negative toward it. I wasn't being terribly rude toward whatever was there. But I think I know my boundaries now, and I, and I think I did push it a little too far. Um, I do not feel comfortable, and our team will not use the uh, Ouija board. I uh, made a documentary a couple years ago, and we did a reenactment of the Velisca Axe murders. And we actually gave Johnny Hauser the real axe that might have supposedly been the one that was involved in the murders and he got taken over while he had that in his hands and it was scary <laughs> and I mean it could have went south really fast. I think the only thing I wouldn't have done um, for a long time I over obsessed about the paranormal especially with the Veliska Axe murder house I was in there constantly and it really affected my mood like some George Lutz Amityville stuff I look back in hindsight and I was pretty weird there for a while. We do use provocation, but earlier it was, there was no regard as to who we 
we just we would provoke anything. I, I would absolutely agree that there's dangers with provoking. Um, just like, you know, you, you get out at a gas station and start yelling at some guy pumping gas. You might get punched. <laughs> yeah. Not everything deserves to be provoked. Something may follow you home and it might be nasty. Has anything followed you home from a cave? Um, I personally haven't. Um, we've, we've thought we might have, but it's ended up just being the place we lived was haunted. And uh, me personally, I've never had anything follow me home. It is just an, a natural routine for me, and it, it will be for our team, is that we, we say a prayer before and after the investigation. Uh, it, it's hard for me, because I live just right next to the Velisca Axe Murder House, to tell if anything's followed me home, because our house is haunted. What do you think about teams who make this feel competition or fighting amongst other teams? My evidence is better than yours, or yours is nothing because I wasn't there, you know, whatever. It's, it's just straight ridiculous. Teams that try to compete, I, I don't see what the point of, how, what, are we, what are we competing over? I, I think that television has made it a competitive venue when it really doesn't have a place in the field. There really is no reason for it. I am seeing a lot more solidarity, a lot more reaching out. Teams that don't know what they're doing are now networking with people that do know. We're, we're all in this for the same thing, and there is no set rule book on how you're supposed to do something. So let the team do what they want, how they want, and it's that simple. I mean, there is no reason at all. Uh, paranormal drama is completely ridiculous. You know, we're all doing the exact same thing. Nobody's better. Nobody's techniques are better. Why don't, you know, we go back to the roots of why we all do this. And it's to find evidence of the paranormal, and it's a blast. Some people use metaphysical, some people use scientific. It's all, we're all after the same thing. Paranormal unity. Exactly. You know, I always joke, one of these days there's going to be a drive-by shooting because so-and-so team's on my turf. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. When I'm all flamboyant on the, the camera, then I'm going to become a TV star. And I think most of those people are just in it to try and get their 15 minutes of fame, um, which is sad, you know, because it gives the people that are really in it a bad name. Um, there's too many teams that create themselves, and within a month, they're on YouTube saying they're the hottest thing on the planet and that everyone should be watching them and that they have the best evidence. And it's like, okay, you might have a great piece of evidence and I completely respect that, but you need to go about it as evidence, not, hey, look at this thing I got here. Give me a award because I did it quicker and faster and better than every single other person who's ever done this. No, I'm sorry. That's ridiculous. Encouragement is only the only thing that our team is going to be doing. Grounds for removal if they are and you catch them? Oh, we'll have a talk. Okay. What do you think about the term para-celebrity? Um, para-celebs. Yeah, I think... I don't really look at any reality star as a celebrity, I guess. People are, are using the field to go out and investigate and call themselves para-celebrities, I think, and this is my opinion, um, to make money off of it. When I think celebrity, I think Brad Pitt, you know... Someone on a scale, not exactly Snooki. Exactly, yeah. Snooki is not anything of a celebrity to me at all. <laughs> Thoughts on properties at price gouge or places that make money or try to make money off of historically tragic <laughs> events? You know, paying for a historic location at a reasonable price is good because it helps that location um, stay afloat. It helps with restoration. It helps keep it going. Uh, when you get into the $1,500 for three or four hours, I think that's just completely ridiculous. It's not wrong completely, but at the same time, you have a choice to investigate those places or not. What what message might you have, real quick message, uh, for demon chasers? Thinking, demon oh, there's chasers. something evil here. Let's go ahead and <laughs> mess with them. And, um, <laughs> any thoughts? Demon chasers. That's uh, uh, Honestly, it's almost laughable. It's... Purely ridiculous. Demon chasers, uh, those that are going out and just literally provoking up a storm, um, that's great entertainment. Um, that goes along with the field of um, celebrityness. I mean, we've investigated Villisca, I think, what, eight times? Mm -hmm. The difference between the oh, first wow. time we were there and the last time is incredible. The first time, it was more children here and there. 
not much anything negative. And demons are not anything to mess with. You feel that some of those places it's been brought on by maybe unregulated, uh, you know, people coming in, Ouija boards and Absolutely. stuff like that. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. No doubt in my mind. Here, Ferrar, that boiler room was the quietest place ever when we started coming here. That place has become one of the scariest places in the building. And I think it's people dicking around down there doing stupid stuff. I've met three individuals in my life that have participated in exorcisms. And when I say that, the Catholic Church brought them in to record events. And every one of those people said they were really into it, went and did it, and they never even want to think of that night again. They'll never do it again. They want nothing to do with it. That's real. Finally, any advice or message you wish to provide amateurs, whether it's high school, kids going to a cemetery for giggles, or... Checking out the local cemeteries. Number one, you have to have permission to do all, to do all that. So make sure you're going about it the correct way. Ask questions. You know, I, I'm big, and I still, you know, right, right off the bat, I would seek out team members and people that's been doing it longer and ask questions and learn. Learn, 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 read as much as you can. You're not going to learn all of it off of a TV show. Um, I didn't go start out with a Ouija board or anything like that. I, I just had so many questions. Read books. Research. 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 Gosh. Zach people. Baggins is not going to tell you how to hunt ghosts properly. Learn from someone that uh, um, knows what they're talking about, has done their research. You know, it doesn't just go back to when Jason and Grant wrote their first book. It's been done for centuries by geniuses, by very smart people. Research all areas of it. Figure out what you're dealing with before you go after it. And when you do, start slow. Go in. Get that feeling. I mean, when we started, it was scary. I yeah. mean, any little thing, voices, what we've seen, it was terrifying. Uh, make sure that you do a little bit of background research on how long the team has been around. Some teams have thrown around the phrase collective years of experience. Well, that could simply mean somebody has 10 years, the next person has one, the next person has three. And as a whole, they really don't have that much. Network with other teams, see how they do it. You can use these clients as referrals for your next investigation and so on and so forth. And that puts out a good name for you. Just go about it a legit way. Network, make friends. You know, Par uh, paranormal unity. Paranormal unity, definitely. Is there anyone here? We're knowledgeable enough to say, okay, I can sense this or that or, or whatever it might be that comes with that kind of a haunt. And I'm backing out because I have knowledge of it. Not because of some TV show that says this person gets scratched, that means there's a demon here. No, we, we researched it. We opened a book. We didn't go to our t touch screen phone and ask something on there and go, what's a ghost? No, we read books, we researched it, and we took our time. We evolved, we matured, all that. We took the time that this field deserves. So don't expect to make tons of money and buy your own mansion in Vegas. Or see your first apparition on the first case. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> don't be disappointed oh right away. Patience. Yeah. Yeah, it was Have years. patience getting into it, have patience while you're in it, have patience when you're done with it. Don't treat it like it's Casper dancing around the corner. Yeah. yeah. Um, just have caution and ease um, and have fun too at the same time my pleasure and just keep it real and keep your head on straight have fun remember to have fun that's what it's all about unfortunately positive doesn't exist without negative both are needed to teach lessons in life Eric Klein Experiment's gonna be, we're gonna play what we call voice trigger object. The darker side shouldn't be glorified, but what's some realities of it? The thing about the ghost boxes, and I've learned this over dealing with it for the last two years, is that you've got to be able to decipher from actual radio commercials or whatever talking. Hi, my name's Chris Evan. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. I've been doing the paranormal since I was 15 years old. Um, I won't tell you how many years that's been because then you'll know my age. So, And who's on the line with me is Bishop James Long. Why don't you go in and start telling a little bit about you, uh, some of your background. Um, well, you know, I studied for the Roman Catholic priesthood for six years. I knew I wanted to be a priest since I was a little boy. Um, actually, since five. Study uh, demonology at the age of nine. I didn't really know why, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. I saw my first ghost in the
the uh, battlefield at Gettysburg while filming the movie Gettysburg. And uh, we were walking across the field at Pickett's Charge and an actual unit of Confederate soldiers came out of the fog and I was hooked ever since. Uh, since then, we went from doing uh, just um, businesses to homes to whatnot to then eventually I got into the actual uh, demonology side of the field and started start, uh, studying to be a spiritual warrior. And that's basically what I do now. I help families that are dealing with darker entities, things that uh, other people really don't want to deal with. And I've studied it all my life. Um, I decided to pursue uh, the Catholic uh, seminary, the priesthood, and studied there. During that time, I was mentored by an exorcist. I had chose through formation and prayer that it was best to um, go into the old Catholic independent movement because for me, I, I believe that God was telling me that this is where I needed to serve people. There would be less restrictions. And so I was ordained a deacon and priest and consecrated a bishop. I have a doctorate degree, a doctorate in ministry. I have two masters. I have a bachelor's and I have a associate degree. I performed 26 exorcisms. Uh, on people who are violently possessed, and I have performed quite a few you know, minor rites, uh, minor order of exorcisms, to provoke you know, a malevolent or demonic entity to manifest itself, and then you perform the ritual to cleanse a home. Back in 2008, there was a show on called Paranormal State, and they aired their very first one-hour episode. That episode was called Ion 6. And it was a family in a little town of Quincy, Illinois, that was dealing with a demonic presence uh, to the fact that even that the young lady uh, of the family became possessed. That case was actually my case. That was a case that I worked uh, with the family vigorously for months trying to get them help. Uh, the last thing we wanted to do was be on TV or get on TV or put the family on TV. But unfortunately, we just didn't have the money to get the people there that needed to help the family, and we knew A&E could foot that bill. Have you noticed any increase in actual demonic activity or attacks during uh, this paranormal cultural increase that we're going through? Well, you know, I, I've seen a, a lot of people who I've read. I, have, I, I started the paranormal clergy oh, 13 years ago or so, 13, 14 years ago. I've, I've read a lot of people who reported it. No, I have not seen a legitimate increase in cases. In your view, uh, describe differences between demonic oppression and uh, full possession. Infestation, oppression, possession. Infestation is when a demonic entity will infest itself within a home or dwelling. Oppression is, and, and again, you will hear bangs and loud noises. Um, odors, uh, it smells like horrible rotten flesh, but it, 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 it's you know, a terrible experience. Uh, Father Andrew Calder was the priest that came in and did the exorcism. Uh, he is since deceased, uh, God rest his soul. Um, and that case took a lot of toll on a lot of people that were involved. Uh, from myself and the original team that went in and investigated, we all have had problems and situations that we've had to deal with. Uh, due to the demonic entity, uh, to the cast and crew that filmed the episode I Am Six, and even Ryan Buell, um, uh, Chip Coffee, they, they will all tell you stories and things that have happened to them after they dealt with that case. And there's something that people don't realize, and I didn't know it at the time either, it was something I wasn't educated in, was that once you deal with a demonic case, you are marked for life. And people ask, well, well how are you marked for life? What do you mean? Well. The thing is, is that the devil wants to destroy man because you're made in the image of God. That's my religious belief. That's a lot of people that believe in that religious belief. Now, we're not pushing that belief on anybody else, but due to our belief, that's what it says. So if you're a warrior that's coming and helping families deal with these demonic entities or whatnot, they're going to mark you. They're going to know that you're somebody that is, um, that's out to get them. So what they're going to do is, in return, they're going to attack you. And uh, during the stage of oppression is when it begins to interact with the victim. And this is a very dangerous stage because in this stage is when the oppression and will begins to uh, become attacked. And that is a very, it can be a very long stage, depending on the person's intellect and will. 
Uh, and this is when it begins to attack them on a psychological, a spiritual, on a physical level. So, uh, and it, it, the person begins to think they're going crazy. They're going nuts. They're hearing things. They're seeing that they're seeing visions. It's uh, interacting with their sleep, interacting with their, their consciousness, with the the psyche, and they and then it gets to the point where the intellect, where they get to the they eliminate all friends, you know, all friendships, and they become um, a hermit. Their intellect and will has been eradicated, and the person then uh, goes into a stage of possession, where the demonic will then begin to possess the body. Um, and we were all affected. We were all attacked. We've all had personal attacks uh, since that case. Um, I live day to day, not knowing uh, what's coming at me next. Uh, I have to have my house blessed. I have to be blessed. Bishop Long. Uh, blesses me every year uh, with uh, chrism oil, which is one of the one of the most powerful uh, oils that that priests use to to do blessings uh, to keep me cleansed and keep these things at bay. Um, my family has been attacked. Uh, these things have showed themselves to my children, and people say, you know, well, if this is going on, why don't you get out of the field? Well, whether I'm in the field or not, it's going to happen. It's going to come at me. And this is, the, this is the message that teens need to understand that when you go running into a house, you're not always dealing with little Susie or, or the, our grandpa that died last week or, or whatever the case may be. You may actually run into something that you're not prepared for and you can't run from it. This information is, is, is common knowledge that most people know, however, and that's just as well for other things, which I can't share. But I will say these things, I mean, these things have occurred, which I have seen, other 26 exorcisms that I performed. But the people will, will, you know, have knowledge of future events or hidden things. Hidden things meaning um, when I am in, uh, on a scene and someone is possessed, there are things that I will do. And usually the person is not in the state of possession when I arrive. There's a thing called full possession and per, uh, transient possession. Transient possession is when the person goes in and out of possession. And I found that, that that's the majority of cases. But I am provoking through prayer and using sacramentals because I want the entity to manifest itself. A superhuman strength will occur. Uh, speaking in unknown or strange languages, they will have they will have knowledge of Aramaic or other languages. I I begin to speak to our, to our Father in Aramaic, and they will. Be, I've had a demonic entity say to our Father in Aramaic backwards as a form of mockery. Uh, people have uh, people who have been uh, possessed will levitate uh, smells. People who are uh, possessed have often um, have issues of smelling of rotten flesh. So these are the things that have nothing to do with, with um, a psychological issue. A person who, is, who has psychological illness can, cannot levitate. A person who is psychologically ill cannot uh, mimic the voice of a deceased loved one. A person who's a psychologically ill cannot know what you are doing in, in, with a hidden action which no one else knows. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening and we ask you to bring forth the uh, Almighty Angel, Michael, Archangel, to protect us and surround us with his love and his light. Please let the spirits that are here know that we are here only to help them, to understand them, and to hear any messages that they need to tell us. Nothing here can, can attach itself to us, can harm us in any way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And uh, that's what I do now. I, I tour uh, the United States doing lectures on the dangers of ghost hunting, on demonic entities, on possession, uh, oppression, uh, different stages of uh, things to look for. Um, I provide blessed medals and stuff for people to be able to protect themselves with. Um, I connect people with uh, churches and clergy that need help. You know, this is something that nobody was doing in the field or it was being done very little. There are a lot of other people out there that do it now. And Paranormal Endeavors and myself personally also believe that mental illness needs to be ruled out very first um, when considering anything. Um, you might want to consider that before, um, before you think demonic. And so exorcism especially is a last resort. I've talked to Father Gary Collins um, several times, who uh, he is the priest in the movie The Rite, 
mm-hmm. uh, was based on in life. And the one thing he always told people is, uh, when people say, I need an exorcism, he told people, I don't do them on demand. And one, one thing that I always tell people is that, that the exorcisms are of absolute 100% last resort. I won't even speak to the person. That's number one. Um, so when, when people contact me, either through email, I will not return their call. I, I immediately send them to the paranormal clergy. The paranormal clergy was an organization that I started 13, 14 years, and I started for the sole purpose of paranormal, helping the paranormal community because there was no clergy helping the paranormal community at all. So what I did is now I have Cat Lane and Rich Valdez, who are basically two full-time administrators for the paranormal clergy. They answer all the emails, and they answer all the return all the phone calls. Plus, they have teams all across the United States. People want to see the glorious side of it. The TV shows have come in and, and have made it out to be such a glor- glorified thing, and it's really not. You know, I tell people there's a difference. There's a ghost hunter and there's a paranormal investigator. A ghost hunter is somebody that goes running through cemeteries and uh, they're looking for a weekend thrill or want to get a kick out of something. Those are ghost hunters to me. Paranormal investigators are somebody that dedicates their life to a 24-7 job that you will not be paid for. It's something that you have to be fully dedicated to 100%. Whatever team is in that area, they investigate. If it warrants the clergy's um, attention, then we get involved as it should be. If someone says that they need an exorcism, they must have a psychological evaluation by a licensed psychiatrist. That's non-negotiable. Plus, I have to have a physical evaluation. Plus, I have to know every single medication the individual is taking. A person who has paranoid schizophrenia, you can put them in a delusional state and they can commit suicide. So, this is a very dangerous, very dangerous ministry. Um, clients need to really protect themselves when it comes to getting a team uh, to help them. The internet is, a, is an awesome resource. Uh, do, your, do your homework. Uh, you know, look for a team, look at their credentials, look at things that they have done, uh, ask around, ask other teams, you know. Um, get, get, it's almost like a reference system. Ask a team for reference. Team will, a team will have references if they've been around for a while and they've done this a lot. If somebody is charging, run. I can't stress the importance of first-hand knowledge and field experience uh, compared to just second-hand education. Like just saying, uh, oh, well, I've seen that in the movie. I can go out and now I can just say, you know, demon be gone, and it works just like in Hollywood. That's insane. I will never, ever divulge information about what we do when we go on the scenes and, and the actual ritual itself. Although, unfortunately, people go online and they think they're getting the ritual or they, they think they're getting um, the actual, you know, the, the prayer. And, and you can, unfortunately, you, you are able to get your hands on um, uh, the, the right. The problem is, is um, unless you know what you're doing, you have no business performing it. A huge misconception is that is that there are people who say, well, I have a calling. I have a calling to cast out demons. So therefore, because I'm a Christian, I can. That's the mentality. Well, I, I, I tell everybody, I have a calling to be a pilot, but I have no training. But I'm gonna get in the 747 cockpit. Now, are you gonna get in that plane without me having any training at all? No. Why is it that people who think they just have a calling for something, that that means that they don't have to have any training? There is no one, there's no governmental agency who's regulating this. So it's an open field. People are confused about the difference between a deliverance and an exorcism. And that's the same thing. A deliverance is when someone is under the stage of oppression and you pray for the person to release that stage to release the attachment, that's oppression. Possession is when the, the demonic entity is actually taking possession of the body. The person could expire. Uh, for others that have dealt with the cases and have been uh, become a mark of what I can say is just, you know, make sure you keep yourself grounded, make sure you keep yourself protected. Whatever your religion is, whoever your God is, make sure you surround yourself uh, with that and, and protect yourself, protect your family. It goes beyond just you. The one thing that we don't know about uh, this field is we don't know the long-term effect, whether it be dealing with just regular spirits or dealing with demons. Demons have, they don't have a time frame. A week to them is, you know, a day. 
uh, a month to us is, is a minute to them. So just because you make it through life without being attacked or having anything done to you doesn't mean they won't come back and attack your children or your children's children. So you need to make sure you are, you are protected. And I know you've ran into these people too, but folks that just want to be present, they want to video, they want to uh, witness an exorcism, and there's risk with that, uh, isn't there? Absolutely, and, and, and it happens quite often. Um, because if, if you don't, if, if, you, if you go into a situation where you're not properly trained, what's going to happen when you walk into a situation where it really is a demonic situation? What, what are you going to do? I mean, that's what, that's what I always find fascinating about people who will tell me, especially investigators, well, I investigated this place and nothing bad happened, and I'm angry. And I think, really? That's like saying, that's like saying, well, I, 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 I swam in the ocean and I didn't get bit by a great white. Bag on. It just doesn't make sense to me. No. Because they think it's a thrill. They think it's just like a haunted house attraction, and then they get to go home and nothing else happens afterwards. So much focus has been towards the negative side. It seems like it's been glorified in Hollywood. We forgot about the positive. Right. That's right. And I know you've encountered this, but three scratch marks have come up a bunch of times within the field. Um, please explain uh, what three scratch marks tend to mean or this mocking of Trinity. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, what I find fascinating about that whole, scr whole scratches is that nobody, dis well, nobody was discussing those three scratches at all until the Ghost Adventures episode when they came to my church with Bobby Mackey's. And I kind of, I, and I guess I shouldn't have done that, I guess, uh, I, again, I, but when he, when he asked me a question, I told him, what's the marking of the Trinity? So a demonic entity, anything, that, you know, the marking of the Trinity is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So that's Trinity. And we, we believe in a Trinitarian formula. So when you're talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, at any cost, uh, they will mock. I protect myself with uh, St. Michael the Archangel and my, my staff that's with me and, and all of our equipment. And then once we're done with the investigation, we do a closing prayer. We let whatever know is there, they can't follow us. They can't attach themselves to us and come home with us. They have to stay where they are. And it's just simple things, you know, and even if you don't believe, what will it hurt? It won't. Some people may think that there's actually legit exorcisms happening on every street corner. I don't know what the, the, the actual perception is. It's interesting because actually uh, the Benedict uh, requested that some more priests be trained on the right itself, which I think was a good call because there were a limited number of priests that were really trained on the right. And of course, you know, that was, it was revised, like you said, but I think we got to understand that when you're talking about demonology and possession, you're not talking about paranormal. Demonology has nothing to do with paranormal. Demonology has everything to do with theological. Here, here's, what, here's what people don't know. That the first mention of exorcism as an office comes from a, actually a letter written by Pope Cornelius in 253. That's a very ancient rite. And the first, first four, the first four rite of exorcism was written in 1614. So this is a very ancient and sacred rite. It's a very sacred rite. That would be like me picking up a shamanic ritual and just performing it. I'm not a shaman. What are your thoughts on um, paranormal teams or individual investigators going into places and, you know, within five hours, eight hours, whatever the case may be, telling the client that they have a demon in their home and then leaving. You know, one, one thing that I'm concerned about is that you have a lot of people within the paranormal community who are, and, I, and I'll just be very blunt, who are running around investigating uh, claims of demonic infestation, and yet they've never studied angel, angelology. How is, that, how is that possible? How can you go to someone's home and then you tell a client you have a demon in your home and yet you never studied angelology. Never. That, that to me is beyond comprehension. They have no concept of fallen angels. And yet they're able to, to ascertain whether or not a demonic entity has infested itself within the home. How? And then they, just as you said, they go and they tell these people who are really scared, well, you have a demon in your home, and then they leave. Yeah. Yep. That is 
absolutely horrible. Horrible. That's a disservice. Where, where does this come from? You can walk into a house and you can have religious objects that are desecrated. You can have terrible things. You can have a person who's levitating, uh, speaking in dead languages. And you can say, okay, something is not right here. I don't know enough about possession or demonic infestation, but I know enough that I don't feel good here. And I know enough that this is not right. And I know enough that I need to call uh, a priest who is trained in this. That's absolutely perfectly fine. Now, I respect I respect people 100% when they do that. Yeah. But what I don't like is when people walk into a place and say, oh, there's demons everywhere. I work with helping some of my team members open up um, on their gifts and the spiritual side of uh, their learning. But how would you suggest teams try to figure out if an investigation or a location they're investigating has something negative? Sir, I, I applaud you guys a lot for... Um, you know, doing the preliminary questions. That's that's really wonderful that you guys did that. I, I because these are things that I do, and these are the things that I have found, uh, uh, you know, a first-hand experience. And then when other people find these things, it, it always solidifies what you find yourself. And I think it's tremendous. And I think that is what the paranormal community should be about: sharing what we have in the field, sharing what we have found. An individual who's an archbishop, friend of mine that I know. Um, has asked this kind of a question before, and if he gets a response that's anything but yes, he usually, he knows. Standpoint, no. yeah. No. Do you worship Jesus Christ? Maybe. Maybe again. Oh, I heard it again, same voice. Is he your higher power or not? No. I don't know, that sounded kind of like a growl. Kill hate. Kill hate who? Archbishop. Did you hear that? Did you hear Archbishop? No, I applaud you guys for doing it. Am I afraid that, this, that whatever it is came through said kill Archbishop? Absolutely not. Um, I, you know, because I, I like, I, like my buddy Tim Yancey says, and I mean, and I truly believe this, demonic entities are parasites. They are absolute parasites. They are cowards. They're opportunists. But once you look at them dead eye in the face, face to face, and you say, come, come on, absolutely come get some, they run like cowardly dogs. It is only when you're sick and when you're weak, that's when they start prowling through. That's when they start making themselves known like little cockroaches. I would not allow them to make me afraid. Do you have a message for me? Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening and we thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for letting us help these spirits and communicate with them. And hopefully uh, you've used us as a tool uh, to help these uh, spirits that are trapped here to move on and, and, and be under your grace. Anything that's here, you're not allowed to attach yourself to our equipment, our beings, our stuff. Anything with us, you cannot go home with us. This is where you dwell. This is where you must stay. Please respect that. Please protect everyone as they leave here this evening and make sure that they get home and make it back here tomorrow. In the name of the great, amen. People get into this field making it a competition, commercializing it. Um, I strongly think that that takes away from the core purpose of the investigations. There is always someone who goes at it like, my dust orb is better than yours. But if someone thinks that they have a legit powerful and dark visitor, how should they reach out? <laughs> Selfishly, I, I would contact the paranormal clergy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they can contact us at paranormalclergy at yahoo.com. And just um, send us an email exactly what's going on. And well, but but if if they have if they have a pastor they can go to first of all they have a pastor they can go to they can trust it's always always best to contact your pastor there are some pastors that aren't aren't so open and willing to discuss these issues and so therefore some people just they don't have that support again I started a paranormal clergy so that they know they have clergy support somewhere you know if if their case uh, doesn't throw a bunch of red flags then we will then put that into the Paranormal Clergy Affiliates page and the team that's within their area will investigate. And 
not only do they investigate, they resolve. Letting people know about Inspire Radio. Because we have night prayer every single night at 10 o'clock. That's absolutely crucial for me. Because there are so many people that need help, that need prayer. No problem, brother. No problem, man. Giving back, giving back, giving back. Letting people know they're not alone. Thank you for um, participating and sharing your thoughts um, um, with us. I'll offer you have a good night. You too. Bye. Hi, Teresa. Thanks for taking your time to talk with me today. You bet. Um, a couple things I wanted to address um, about paranormal and kind of mental health in general. I have a master's degree. I'm a clinical social worker. And uh, basically what that means is I've done counseling and psychotherapy uh, since about 1991. So have a, a long history of working with mental health problems. And... Uh, in my current practice, I see individuals, couples, and children, so I have a wide variety of clients, everything on the spectrum from simple depression all the way up to schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder. Tell me a little bit about some of the history you have in the paranormal. I mean, did you kind of have an interest in it yourself? Yes, I've always had an interest in it. Having a mental health background as far as um, my degrees was helpful to be able to see sometimes what might be a way to debunk some of the uh, things that people were seeing or hearing. Um, and just generally uh, going into a home uh, and seeing what's around there and seeing the personalities of the people that are there, sometimes you can tell right off the bat it's more of a mental health issue than it is a paranormal. Do you think that the field has moved maybe not in the best direction in terms of, you know, paranormal activity versus what's actually some kind of a mental health thing. Do you think there's a lot of people jump into conclusions because maybe the media, the things they see in shows now that instantly, you know, logically thinking mental health kind of goes out the window and it's something demonic. Right. Well, I think entertainment has become the norm for a lot of paranormal investigations. It's more about We've got, to, we've got to find something and we've got to label it, you know, as sinister, or, you know, somebody's dead aunt instead of possibly looking at the more reasonable explanations. Then there are some individuals that may have disorders that investigators may come across. Does that mean that they're more susceptible or draw in paranormal activity? No, I, I do believe that having either a mental health disorder or some type of uh, cognitive deficit as in mental retardation would make somebody more vulnerable or open to that. Uh, not necessarily because of their thinking process, but more because uh, their, their cognitive abilities may be compromised and so they might be able to be reached more easily than someone that's using all of their faculties. Then of course I had to mention the well-known myth about us not using our full capacity of our brain. Would these locked secrets explain some activity? We have so much research left to do to find out uh, what capacities we have, but we're, you know, we know that you only retain about five percent of what you learn and for a person that is struggling with mental illness, certain parts of the brain may be triggered, certain neurotransmitters may be working differently that would cause or at least suggest that they might be more open to some of uh, the paranormal type things that happen. Most of us may know somebody, or we might be that person, that tends to have some kind of drama in their life or baggage. They're prone to paranormal attachments or attacks. First of all, I think you're absolutely correct that when you're in a heightened emotional state, you are uh, perhaps more... Susceptible, vulnerable to... Yeah, um, yeah, susceptible or I guess receptive is the word mm -hmm. I want to use to that type of thing. And I think, it, ideally, we would all just have all of our stuff worked out before we went on an investigation, but that's not possible. So I think if you're just aware as an investigator when you're going into a situation, 
what's going on in your personal life that could impact you or could impact the, the results that you're getting. I know uh, when I went on an investigation shortly after my separation, it was highly emotional and I was open to a lot more stuff. Then of course I wondered what our mental health expert might recommend for somebody like this. Yeah, whatever works for a person, whether it's medication or you know some type of uh, concentration on uh, a topic or music, anything that helps you connect and feel safe and well going into a situation. Now all of a sudden it might appear that there's more spirit sensitives or psychics in the world than there used to be. There might be. I, I do think that there's always been very sensitive people in the world. It just hasn't been given the attention that it is now. And more people are coming out now, they feel more comfortable. Right. It's becoming a more acceptable thing. If there's any family history of mental health issues, that needs to uh, be ruled out ahead of time before you're assuming that this is paranormal. There's a lot of symptoms that can mimic, say, demon possession, such as hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, um, extreme paranoia, and, uh, you know, bodily sensations, you know, like feeling touched or feeling like there's somebody inside of you. Those are the kinds of things that one could look at and say that that person has a demon or they're possessed. Most people might be quick to chop up to somebody with a brain disorder who might be seeing things as, oh, it's all in their head, it's part of their disorder, but maybe not. You don't want to completely rule it out as a possibility, but you need to take into account that some of those symptoms might be more related to the mental health diagnosis that they have. It's a very fine line, and so I've had both uh, uh, cases where somebody thinks they might have a ghost in their house, or I've had several people that claim to have been abducted um, more by like aliens and UFOs. So once again, I have to go through that process of determining you know, what is the possibility and what could be the mental health symptoms. Do you, do you do any kind of hypnosis kind of stuff? I do what's called EMDR, and EMDR is uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And basically what EMDR is designed to do is to help people work through traumas that they've had in their past. It is a type of hypnotic state, but it's not full-blown hypnosis, which I am not qualified to do. It's like I've always said, it's not so much even the older generation of paranormal investigators before us, but it's the younger ones I'm a little concerned about. So, mm -hmm. um, but thank you for your time today. And you bet. All right, so I've known people who have moved into their dream house and they think there's nothing going on there and they don't even think of anything potentially that could go on spiritually wise there. And... They've moved in and they got all their stuff in there and then they've been there for like about a week and then things just start coming out and it starts getting more active. Yeah, I've heard that too. I know some colleagues, friends of mine as well, who have lived that nightmare, who have, who have moved into a property. Maybe it's a good deal on the price. Maybe, you know, it, it, it drew them in, but then as they found out later for the wrong reasons. Um, so... Yeah, I, th I think there's some um, exploring that needs to be done uh, on, you know, the realtor side of things. You may be familiar with the haunted properties that become famous like the Amityville Haunting or the Villisca Axe Murder House. We have heard unfortunate stories of people finding their quote-unquote dream home and then days, weeks, months later finding out the hard way that it is more of a nightmare home. Daily, people all over the world shop real estate or rental properties and brush up unknowingly against unwanted hauntings. But due to financial and contract terms, it becomes difficult or nearly impossible to back out of the deal. We spoke with a couple of realtors about the subject, neither wished to be on camera. What we learned was that laws regarding haunted property disclosures vary state by state in the United States. Mostly what is deemed as material facts such as structural concerns, mold, and total square footage need to be passed along to a buyer. 
According to the realtors, currently, haunted properties, also referred to as stigmatized properties, must be disclosed in Iowa. They vary state by state and are sometimes considered gray areas. In Virginia, stigmatized events are not considered material effects, and so it may release realtors in Virginia from obligation to disclose. In New York, property values affected by hauntings can be a reason to disclose. A seller was successfully sued for non-disclosure because the haunting could affect property value. The realtors advise it is always best to check with your most current local laws because they may change. The realtors advise us about kvit and tor or buyer beware, basically stating that the purchaser inspected and assumes the risk that the product is sold as is or may be defected. Kvit venditor or seller beware is what seems to be trending more and more and it means that the seller should be aware of all aspects of the product and can be held liable if a defect is found. One of the realtors we spoke with works within the paranormal field as a realtor selling specifically haunted properties. Properties that have been investigated and verified for their disembodied occupants, this has become a more popular interest now, not always for the right reasons, and some people may be looking intentionally for that house with a ghostly Confederate soldier roaming around, or that murder house where an entire butchered family still occupies the home with or without the evil murderers still with them. Bottom line is, check your local agencies on current laws regarding haunted disclosures. Some haunted properties never sell and are marketed well below market average. Flat out, ask your realtor if it is haunted or if traumatic events such as suicide or murder happened on the property. Ask local neighbors as well, because haunted properties can take on the local gossip. Bring a legit psychic with you when you home shop, and with any property it never hurts to have the house blessed anyway by clergy. Just know your options and know your laws, and maybe we can help prevent another unaware buyer from entering another dangerous haunting situation. A commercial site of Paranormal has properties open for the public. Here's Mason House Inn. Along the Des Moines River in extreme southeast Iowa exists a small town that many would say has been stuck in time. Bentonsport may not be a large population center, but there is a location in town that may grab one's attention. I had a near-death experience when I was three and uh, sort of had an out-of-body, watched myself. <clears throat> and then when I was five, I realized I was seeing people that my rest of my family wasn't seeing, entities that aren't human. We bought the inn not knowing it was haunted. Um, it was, uh, I don't know, it just kind of called to us, and we thought, well, we'll do that until we find something else to do. And, um, but then um, after we bought it, they told us about Mary Mason Clark on the third floor and just to leave her alone, and we thought, okay, fine. And then our guests started telling us about hearing children running in the hallways at night and why didn't their parents put them to bed. Um, people talking about hearing women, uh, people arguing and wondered if it was Chuck and me arguing at 3 in the morning and there wasn't anybody else here but them. I don't know, it was sort of a don't ask, don't tell because we were afraid that people wouldn't come if they knew the place was haunted. So if they told us that they knew, then that was fine. But if they didn't mention it, we didn't mention it. And you started your journal keeping track of all the stories from the time uh, we arrived here. I did, because we wanted to see if it had something to do with um, science. Yes. Yeah, the, the sun, the moon, the, the weather. Uh, a lot of my questions are historical with the town, the building, the people here. I'm, I'm intrigued by people's personalities and who were here in the 1800s. And we ask very specific questions about people, dates, buildings, times. And when we get a date, like a building that was destroyed, they'll give us dates and time frame, and we will actually go find newspaper articles to confirm those things. We were actually talking to one spirit here who's um, joined us recently. Uh, it happened to be General Ford from the Civil War. He actually gave us information on the telephone of the dead that was so accurate, we actually Googled his name and found his biography, and it was to the letter, everything he told us in the box. And so he's here by choice, and it's just a phenomenal gentleman who's here. So we do try to verify things. Mason House Inn has history extending all the way back to the early 1800s. Besides switching hands with multiple owners, it's also had multiple purposes. 
The inn was built as a steamboat hotel in 1846. And it was the same year Iowa became a state, only it was completed before statehood. And it was built by the Mormon craftsmen coming out of Nauvoo in 1846. They were hired as laborers to build this, to help build the inn. And it was built for Billy Robinson, who was the first owner, and he called it the Ashland House. And he owned it for 10 years and then sold it to Lewis and Nancy Mason, who uh, purchased it in 1857, and they called it the uh, Phoenix Hotel. And they owned it for 99 years in their family until 1956, when it was sold to Cal and Brother Redhead, and they ran it until 1989. And then Bill and Cheryl McDermott bought it in 1989 and ran it until 2001 when we purchased it. And it was also on the Underground Railroad. Lewis and Nancy Mason were very active in helping slaves come out of Missouri. In 2004, we had a class come here and actually take a photograph of the class, and there was one extra child in the photograph, and there were kids in the class. And it turned out it was a Civil War soldier. And we didn't know who it was. And all of a sudden, we were on the map that went through the county like wildfire that this Civil War soldier lived at the end. Um, the following year, we got a call from Chris Moon, who's a private a paranormal investigator, and he has Edison's Telephone to the Dead, which provides two-way communications with the spirit world real time. And he came here in May of 2005 for the first time, and we actually learned who the little boy was in the photograph, and his name was Marky. And it's been a fabulous um, journey to talk to the spirits here and learn about them, and we now treat them as family. Um, they're, we call them residents. They're our extended family. They interact with us on a constant basis. Yeah, using, you know, seances, Ouija boards, yeah. using, you know, stuff like that, and has altered the act. I, Do I, you ever worry about that here? We were really concerned about that. Um, then we start once we controlled the devices that came in, and Harold basically said he would take over control of the security, basically, at that point. We said, okay, we're not going to worry about it anymore. That's for them to take care of, and they do the guarding of it. But we're yeah, still cautious. We're cautious. We always know that there's a possibility of somebody bringing something with them that's attached to them. But we trust our spirits here that they will take care of it and make it exit out of the building. We had some confusion this last weekend with a spirit that tried to get in and, and make themselves at home and, and uh, tried to uh, use joy as the mechanism to do it. And I basically told him out loud to exit the building. He was an earthbound spirit. It was not his home. He was to leave because it was not his place to be here. And the spirit left because we put our foot down. There's also the, um, you know, the psychics and mediums yes. and stuff that are sh uh, charlatans and, and that are kind of... Uh -oh. Have you had anybody really come in here that seemed to be blowing a lot of... Well, we I don't know... We have conflicting stories. Yes. Yeah. One will say, this is happening, and another one will say, that's happening, and... And then there was a hole in the floor with the aliens mm. peeping at us. No, the hole is in the ceiling with the aliens mm, no, peeping okay. at it. You know, it's like, what do we believe? So we just kind of like, oh, okay, sure. We do get some feedback that's from our spirits here, saying things, whether things are legitimate or not. But we do have spirit, uh, mediums and sensitives coming in here constantly telling us one thing or another. Sometimes they're consistent. Um, when Chris Moon comes, we do ask on the box with Harold and the spirits here, whether a lot of these stories are legitimate or not, and some of them are and some of them aren't. And just like many haunted locations that are open to the public, rules and guidelines evolve over time. But what were some of the things that caused some issues? Well, then they started bringing in these ghost boxes and, and leaving bad stuff behind, and we were having problems with, uh, you know, bad stuff staying in the rooms. And, and then Chris would have to come and he would cleanse the rooms. And and so then Harold told us no more boxes. And so that's, uh, that was, I guess, one evolution of saying what you can do, what you can't do. No seances, no Ouija boards. Harold, one of the Civil War soldiers who's been here the longest, and he's the alpha male here, he actually controls the security of the inn now. And basically he's told us, don't worry about the security of the inn. That's for us to do. And we will protect the inn with our energy. If you say, leave me alone, they'll leave you alone. But again, it's being cordial. But if you come in here and do like the TV shows do and, and try to make it dramatic and command and yell and scream in a building, they will ignore you, leave the room, and uh, you won't get, won't get any evidence because that's, they call it rudeness. It's not appropriate. A friendly haunting, it's boring. 
But again, to actually see that Scooby-Doo apparition is a rarity. Um, Hollywood, to me, just creates the total negative of it. Now, there are some bad sites out there that do have negative spirits in it, and they are harmful. Um, we know some of those sites. I call the Mason House Inn Paranormal Disneyland. It's a fun spot. I also think the TV shows kind of gives them an unrealistic view because they're there for a couple hours and they get all these pictures and EVPs and... Some people are afraid to actually come to the inn because they're afraid of what they see in Hollywood on TV and they'll say, oh, I'm going to scare my run out of the inn. Well, we've yet to have anybody since uh, Chris Moon's come here in 2005, we've yet to have anybody running out screaming out of the inn because they saw something terrible because it doesn't happen here. And now if you should have a desire to want to be stared at while you're laying in bed or try to have an encounter with a Civil War soldier or just to get away. We're open year round to the public. Uh, we are uh, by, reservation. by reservation. Thank you. Yes, we do take reservations. We do keep a couple year calendar. We are getting busier and busier every year. To, if for those teams that want to come and investigate, you're going to have to make appointments in advance. Um, Probably about 75% of the people coming now are actually coming either ghost hunting or ghost hoping, which is another category we have now. People having wanting to have experiences. It's uh, G-rated for those families that want to bring kids and things like that. And we do have three, that's correct, three non-haunted rooms that are outside the building, and the spirits will leave those rooms alone unless they're invited over. But if you invite them to come in and play, they'll come in and play. And another look at another property for our school. About 25 minutes north of the Des Moines metro area exists an old, unique school building. Why is it unique, you might ask? And how did the current owners come about to make it their home? Well, my, uh, my daughter was uh, part of a local children's theater group, and they had spotted this place and were considering it as their venue. And so I came along with them when they looked at it, and I looked through the window I threw the gymnasium window and I fell in love with it. And when they decided not to buy it, I was very excited because I wanted it. Uh, so I uh, checked into some financing and I was very surprised when I was able to work it all out. And uh, so we ended up purchasing the building. Well, the, uh, the, the idea was originally I was a videographer and I was filming weddings, depositions, things like that and we thought we could utilize the building, fix it up, and, and film live events like weddings. That was our original intent. Yeah. And uh, that's not what ended up happening. We had a lot of restrictions, not to mention money restrictions, but restrictions by county on things we wanted to do. Well, one day I'm out mowing the lawn, riding around on our little lawnmower, and, and uh, in the driveway pulls up Jackie Carpenter with her daughter Beth. And she says that she's been wanting to get into the schoolhouse for a long time, that there's somebody, a spirit in the building that she wanted to talk to. And I thought it sounded like loads of fun. I'd been interested in the paranormal, you know, watched a few of the shows and things like that, but I had never delved into anything like that. Then, what, the first 20 minutes of being in the building, uh, they picked up an EVP and uh, caught the EVP. She's in the bathroom, which of course was, uh, it was the spirit responding to a girl being in the boys' bathroom here. And we're just rounding the corner here, and that's about the time in the audio that we had got a uh, voice, and it sounded like a little boy, and it kind of sounded like a playfulness. It was just like, she's in the bathroom. Kind of like, and I got the impression of ourselves and many other people have been in here, especially in the back portion of it, kind of get uncomfortable in here and they don't really like this bathroom particularly, so not really a number one hangout spot. And whether it's the usual potty humor or not, you might be saying to yourself, of course, not many people want to hang out in the bathroom, or you just find it unreal, but the sensations and emotions are very real. Uh, well, we did have uh, a group that was here, your group was here, and uh, that had an experience in this area. Um, uh, since then, we have had other teams that have come in and felt the same. Alex and his friend Kurt had walked over here, and they got that overwhelming sorrow and needing to break down, um, feeling an oppression. Yeah, the only legitimate experience I've had personally is when Eric took me and my friend to an abandoned school. You okay, Alex? You alright? Yeah. Wow, that was so weird. The feeling of 
just wanting to cry and get in the fetal position was pretty pretty strong. And when was that approximately you first opened it up to public investigators? That was probably originally maybe 2008 or so. And that was probably just a few, but I mean, well, for probably a since years. 2010. Yeah, you know, we used to go, and in the beginning, we went on a lot of the hunts. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at our age, we couldn't do that forever. <laughs> so we no, don't know any longer go on all of them. Yeah. Uh, but believe me, we're always hearing things. And yeah. the noises like cheering and, and people running in the gym. And, of course, the mm -hmm. third floor with the stage room it gets an awful lot of activity. Yeah, a lot. So um, it's a very interesting place to live, let me tell you. Now that we know the current owners, and we pretty much get the idea here that this location is infested with unexplainable activity, how was this building born, and for lack of better terms, how did it die from its original purpose, at least? Well, the, uh, the land was donated by the Geddes family. Uh, Clark Gamble Geddes was the gentleman who donated the land. Uh, he's now buried in the cemetery across the street. Uh, finished in 1921 and opened in 1922. And uh, it was originally first through 12th grade. And uh, it was, uh, I like to explain it, it was like the Mall of America for its time. It was the center of the community. Uh, keep in mind that when, the, when this town first existed, when they built the school, the, there was a big grain elevator out there, there was a market. Um, a bank, there's all kinds of people. Uh, it's still a small town, relatively speaking. It was $100,000 is what it cost to build. And Total. at the time, that was a lot of money. Yeah. And they moved five one-room schoolhouses onto the property uh, out where the um, playground is now. And that was the whole plan, to consolidate those one-room schoolhouses. Uh, the one-room schoolhouses had a tendency to go up in flames. Um, and uh, so they built it with concrete, brick, and steel, this building. And with plumbing and heating. With plumbing and, and heating and, uh, and the electricity. And, uh, you know, looking at the original blueprints, uh, the electricity consisted of one 100-watt light bulb in each classroom, which I thought was uh, really something. That was their electricity for the building. Uh, and uh, there was actually a gentleman who lived in the area that thought that it was just a folly to build the school. The kids didn't need all this. They didn't yeah, need the right. indoor plumbing. Uh, it was first through 12th uh, through, uh, I believe it was 1958. So uh, a lot of people went through their entire school life in this building. And then in uh, 1958, they changed it. They kind of consolidated with Bondurant. And then uh, it was maybe like third through sixth grade, it kind of changed back and forth, whatever grades it was they needed. And then in uh, 2002, it closed its doors. And then it sat empty for about five years when they finally decided to sell it. And uh, that was when I came by, and, and the rest is history. Why would this school have activity? Why would there be even anybody here still around, especially people who find it hard to believe kids' spirits would still be sticking around? Any theories or ideas on that or evidence? Well, we do have, and I haven't been able to confirm it, uh, but I have it on a very reliable source that, and this would have been back quite a ways, probably before the 50s, easily before the 50s, uh, because the land around the schoolhouse has been built up. It was up on a higher perch than it, than it looks or appears to be now. And so there was a much, uh, um, much more of a slope off the south end of the building. And after a long, uh, hard rain, that a little boy had slipped down in there and drowned. Um, again, I haven't been able to confirm that. Um, but uh, there was also a teacher that worked here. Uh, I've been told this by other teachers that worked here and by students who used to say that she saw a little boy here on the first floor in the hallways. Um, and of course that was where I saw the little boy. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning. I came around the corner here and as I came around and stepped here, I saw standing on the steps about four or five steps up the outline of a little boy. Uh, he was about three and a half foot tall, and he was, it was solid outline, uh, just dark. The fact that this building was so important to so many people, 
that so many people were here for 10, 20, 30, even one person worked here for almost 40 years of their life. I think that's why they come back. I think that there were a lot of good times that were had here, and we know that there were a lot of bad things that happened here also. Now, we did find out recently that there was a cross burning on the, right. on the school that's grounds. Some children were, um, were mistreated here also, and we know that for a fact. Now that, I mean, that is direct talk to people who are directly involved, whose names, of course, we can't say, but that's the evidence we have. Oh. Abuse has been staff, abuse has been students or both? Staff. Uh, there's also a lot of neat stories, like, you know, just very strict teachers who would throw things at the students. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of abusive, yeah. too. You can get away with it yeah. now. Folklore, I guess, that when you drive by the school, you're not supposed to yeah. look at it. There was a woman that uh, um, notified us on Facebook that uh, um, out of 10 times that she had driven by here, because she goes by um, on her way to work, that her car stalled right out in front <laughs> of the building. Have you encountered uh, problem-type groups or somebody coming in that you were discovered maybe at the time or later on that, oh. Uh, on two chalkboards, we found Ouija boards drawn on the chalkboards. I don't understand that at all. Some real ones were used. I worry about people coming in and opening up a can of worms or, or bringing in something that we have to live with, literally. You know, I, I often tell people when they come, don't conjure up something that I've got to live with. Uh, to be honest with you, we wouldn't have cared or known the difference if somebody right. did. And as we get more familiar with the paranormal in general, we find, uh, and for our own safety, <laughs> we find that we don't want to allow it anymore and we, we don't go real public with it, but we do make that part of our introduction to the building when we bring people in. But since we're more involved with our safety and the building being consistent, we'd rather they not bring in any or take any out or cause any additional problems. So we're kind of against it. After, after they've been provoking and such, it's just kind of hard for us to tell. It really is. Well, it's a great, we're just not aware most of the time really what's going on and we'll hear screams and usually that's somebody playing with each other we've had a few groups that didn't come in to really investigate they came in just to have a party but we don't uh we don't really know but if you base base it on what we hear the feedback we get back from groups that have been here then i would probably agree that there has been some changes after something like that because we get groups who'll come in and all of a sudden light bulbs are thrown in the boiler room. Well, we've never had, never had anything violent like that. So it was uh, some of these light bulbs here uh, that were thrown at uh, the guests that we had that night. We have had some experiences uh, in here, people coming in and having things thrown. Um, and that was the more recent uh, one was the light bulbs that happened several times. But when you get different paranormal groups, hundreds of them now, and they're months apart from each other. They don't have any idea of the history, yet they come in separately, months apart, and they come up with the same names uh, and that match real people who are here, or they match each other with real people that were here, and that's what happened with one in particular, uh, as one of the principals, that's all I'll say, but the name came up two different times, two different groups. They, they had no knowledge of it from each other, nor did they have knowledge that he ever was a principal. Ever had to rain on someone's parade, so to speak, and actually remove them in mid-investigation because they were doing something? No, there was a group that we wish we had known what they were doing <laughs> and removed them. Yeah, we had uh, one group uh, with uh, younger people that we let in, and they had their chaperones. We made sure they had several. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I don't know if I can say this, I don't know if their chaperones were sleeping or drinking or what. They were just hanging in here. But right yeah, there. they weren't paying attention to what the, what the younger mm -hmm. people were doing and they did damage. Anybody criticized, especially within the paranormal field, I hear anybody criticize each other. I just, I'm in amazement that they even bother. We didn't even know the community was out there when, when we first got involved. People who are in the same boat as you were a few years ago and they're like, oh, I've stuff going on in my place. I'm thinking of maybe having to investigate and opening up to the public. What advice? I would say learn more about the paranormal. Yeah, and about the community and the culture. Yeah, and so you know a little more about it before you start letting people in, I think would be good. 
we kind of fell into it, and like I said, there are things we, we would have not let people do. The other issues like reliability and so on, yeah. but, you know, that's, it, unfortunately, maybe, it's uh, really like running a business. You have to be careful. We've had mm -hmm. not trouble with that. Oh, boy, we could talk about instances. <laughs> but anyway, things happen, <laughs> like broken legs and people falling downstairs. It does happen. So yeah. I would warn somebody on a private basis about that kind of thing. Yeah. But And then maybe a, few, a little bit of warning about, the, about some of the people out there. They're not all serious. And usually they're not really paranormal. They're, they're students <laughs> or something. I shouldn't say that. Cut that out. <laughs> well, that's a nice way to put it. But it's, yeah, yeah. I was trying. Yeah. It, it's been so rare. And that's been the yeah. blessing to us, is that it's just, it's worked out so well for us. And without it, uh, I don't know if we would still even own the building. So it's it's mutually beneficial. Although I will include, yeah, pay some utilities, but to maintain the building is another matter. Oh, right. um, and of course there's a lot to do to six acres in an oh, 18,000 square foot building. Yeah. You know, you tear down a wall in here, like up in the auditorium, that's a big wall. <laughs> you know, it takes a lot to tear it down, so. Any uh, activity spikes during renovations? Because that's, you know, been a common thing in the field. Oh, uh, well, an interesting thing about that question is, uh, yes, especially with the worker. At one point, the uh, ladder was blown down. He opened up the swindle for us. Uh, actually, it was all covered up on the inside and the outside. Those are original to the schoolhouse, one of the very few that's left in the entire building. And while he was working on that building, he had an ovalus working, and uh, the, it kept telling him, be careful, wind, ladder, and it kept saying things like that to him. And uh, finally, the wind came up, and it blew the ladder over, and he was, stu he was stranded up there. He called someone else who called me to come and get him down. The ghost hunting operations at Farrar have evolved over time, and future investigators be warned. I think one day they'll be talking to us. We'll be the spirits in here <laughs> going, hey, quit running down the halls or, you know, put that Ouija board away. I'm not having it, you know. <laughs> And for those who think every building is haunted because of its history, here's Jackie Means reporting. On a cold, dark, rainy night, yes, perfect setting for a typical horror scene, I wanted to see how much truth, if any, there was with a connection between an old house with a morbid history and a paranormal presence. I admit, my long-haired friend was about to amaze me with the history of this home. Hello. 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 I'm Jackie. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm David with... Petruska. Hello, I'm with Paranormal Endeavors. We're doing a documentary um, on the medical physical world, and we're talking about how the misconceptions of people assuming that just because a house is old, there's something haunted about it. Um, I had some questions. Would you like to sit down? Of course. All right, sounds good. Come on in. Basically going over the different theories that people have, that just because a house may be old or that there's been death or anything related to death in the house that it's automatically haunted. Well, this funeral home is a great candidate. It was a funeral home in the 1930s, almost seven years. So there was a bit of uh, emotion, if you will in the house, definitely. I don't know specifically if anyone has died. We know of one supposed ghost that we've heard more or less haunts the place named Pearl Gullock, one of the original inhabitants, the daughter of the actual builder of the house. And Pearl's room was right at the top of the stairs there where she has allegedly been seen um, and she's supposedly been seen coming down from the top of the stairs, um, white, perfectly white, in a white gown. Well, there are certainly a lot of stories surrounding the house, um, some of which I'm sure are exaggerated. For instance, the sightings of Pearl, but this house, just nothing weird at all uh, has happened. It is commonly known in the paranormal field that objects can have attachments to them. With all the antiques and old items here, the thought did cross my mind. Uh, we haven't experienced anything 
uh, no one at the top of the stairs, no one rocking in the rocking chair on the porch. We ventured upstairs to meet Pearl. For a photo that had to be hung in the house, at least she appeared to be a humble lady. Alright, so is this the Pearl in Lynchon? That is Pearl, circa 1917 is when the photograph is taken. She's the only uh, alleged ghost that I know of. Um, um, it's actually a pleasant photograph. Usually people are glowering in old photos, and it's nice to see a pleasant smile like that. Um, she definitely looked like a very pleasant lady. Oh, I'm sure she was, yeah. She lived a very long life, up until her 80s. We have pets. Uh, they don't do anything unusual. They don't stare at corners at invisible people or anything. They don't bark at nothing. There's a lot of stories about how animals are far more sensitive to things than people. And if that's true, um, then this house really isn't haunted because they definitely aren't seeing anything that I'm not seeing. It was time to enter the attic. I admit, the latter scared me more than the ghostly stories. Um, from my experiences, things such as like the attic, for example, since we're about to go up into the attic, um, a lot of people have believed them to be haunted automatically without even thinking of the history of places. It's very, very common. Um, the attic, crawl spaces, places like the basement, the attic isn't always going to be haunted. The basement is always going to be haunted. Even crawl spaces are okay to go into. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as I know, um, this uh, crawl space um, is fine. It's uh, I haven't experienced anything up there. I have found a few interesting objects, though. Uh, old books, um, a mirror that we actually took downstairs to use. Some of the old items in the attic warranted a visit. However, I was thinking, I hope this ladder holds long enough for me to visit them. Uh, well, the books I found in that area over there on those boards, um, there were old books, a uh, box of new books, um, and I think a box of diaries of some kind, not old ones. We actually found this in this very position here. Uh, if anything was going to be uh, spooky at all, at least aesthetically, uh, this is probably taking the cake in the attic at least. Uh. <coughs> People always assume that there's something wrong with the basement, there's something in the basement. Well, this is a finished room in the basement, not particularly creepy. It was a funeral home in the 30s um, for seven years. Uh, many cadavers uh, went through here, uh, autopsies were performed, services given in the upper floors. Alright, so is this the remaining of the chute that you were talking about earlier? This, we are told, is the body chute that they used in the funeral home days. Um, you can see where it's been bricked up uh, in the back there. Um, there's really no telling how many bodies came through here, how many they worked on, um, but this was uh, the old morgue. Formaldehyde tubes, we are told, uh, were once here. Um, they would keep the formaldehyde outside. Of Suddenly we made a discovery. I peeked in near the old chute and there appeared to oh be a surprise God. for David. Yeah, this Not is... charcoal for barbecue? Uh-uh. Charcoal, like... No, it's coal. You can... Because it has that glisten to it. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah, that's it's coal. Done. That's coal. So... Alright, so with um, just walking around the place, and we've definitely come to a good conclusion that this would be a very good example of a house that typically other people would think to be haunted due to the fact of it being a funeral home. I noticed that you used the word claim to be sensitive. What's your views on the whole paranormal factor? And I tend to put so stock in uh, the scientific method. But in this house, as far as it's concerned, um, sensitives and non-sensitives alike have come in here and no, haven't, no, no right. bumps in the night, no mm -hmm. mortician coming back to haunt you. I'm a non-believer, you could say a skeptic, uh, based on experience and based on all the things I've read and all the things I've heard from other people's experience. I mean, it's not just my experience, it's a lot of people's experience. Ultimately, it's about what you want to put stock in. Thank you for your time and thank you for the 
tour of your lovely house. Well, yeah, that's a my pleasure. Meeting up mm -hmm. with you. Not sure on ghosts, but the house had its own personality. And we wanted to incorporate and research a little bit about psychics, you know, spirit sensitives. Um, you're kind of learning about that stuff yourself personally, you know, and I've gone through that stage and I was where you were, you know, where you are now. Um, and I use that skill in Paranormal Endeavors. Our group uses that skill. What are your thoughts on that? I had had a lot of questions in the very beginning about that same theory that there are a lot of fake fakes out there and there are a lot of them, the people who are fake are only wanting in it for the money. Psychics have been controversial and helpful. I got a chance to sit down and engage with a woman who claims to be an empath clairsentient. So how long have you been a psychic and when did you first know you were? I have been a psychic most of my life. Um, since I was a young child, I knew that I knew things ahead of time, knew things before other people would know things. And I really, when I was young, I just thought that it was something that everybody could do. Everybody always knew when, you know, a little bit before the phone was gonna ring or when you got in the car, where you were going. Spending the last two years as a developing sensitive, um, I first got into the field by getting in trouble with the librarian who took me over to the nonfiction section of the library after acting out over a, a reading session and started reading everything I could get my hands on. So I kind of went backwards compared to most people who first had their paranormal experience and then throw themselves fully into the field. My family knew that I could do it. I started talking to friends and some of my closer family members, probably in my teens, um, but it wasn't until probably six or seven years ago that I actually came out of the broom closet as we call it. Um, when you first told your friends and family were they very accepting of it or were they kind of like? My family was really good about it. Um, my mom obviously had experience that we would know things ahead of time. My, my sister was able to do the same thing. Within your group especially because there's others in your group that are also like that just like I have some that are sensitive too. Um, be careful not to feed off of one another, it's mm -hmm. a big thing. So when you um, are out in public, is it kind of like you'll be walking past someone and you, something will click, like you'll sense something or see something? I'm not any, anywhere close to being psychic, I don't believe, so I'm kind of learning this too, but... More so the things in public that will sneak up on me is emotions, if somebody's super happy or super sad or thinking real strongly about something. Those are the type of things that I'll pick up on without trying to, um, for the most part, I, it's pretty on or off for me when I'm not trying to do it. It's not interfering with my life, which I'm grateful for. Yeah, and we, I do have clients that often turn to me and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm calling in a psychic or I'm bringing in a psychic or my, a friend of mine that's a sensitive just walked through the house and absolutely will not go in that room. Uh, what, what that translates for them and what that translates for me is not necessarily the same thing. And I, I've always told people, you know, just like I wouldn't want someone coming into my home and digging through my dresser drawers, I don't think it's appropriate for me to go digging through somebody's messages without them asking me to do it. So, You don't have the credentials of the psychic that or sensitive that walk through there. They may not have very, very much uh, experience in sensing and interpreting energy. So I try to make people understand that, yes, your next door neighbor might be sensitive. Yes, your, your friend might be sensitive. But it's probably best to get somebody who has experience in the field to walk through the house. I personally believe that everybody has intuitive powers within them. You know, we're born having the abilities to do some of the things that the psychics, the mediums, the clairvoyants all do. It's as they grow, they're taught that it's not the norm, it's not what they're supposed to be doing. Gaining knowledge about it, talk to people who have the ability, who, you know, get their stories to see where the similarities come in. Especially try to avoid people that charge. Uh, it's kind of yeah. uh, an unwritten rule in the field that, you know, charging is not really the way this goes. This is a field of academia, we're still learning, we're still growing. To charge gives an indication of providing a service. Unfortunately, with a lot of industries, you know, you're going to have people who are legitimate and more passionate about what they do, and you're going to have people who are simply in it to make the money. There's really no red flag as far as this person's legitimate, this person's not legitimate. Um, I think, and I tell my clients this, you know, anytime that you go for a reading, you have to take what they say with a grain of salt. 
especially in uh, cold cases for detectives that are bringing in working with sensitives or psychics and there's been more than once where they've been led down the wrong road and then at that point somebody's life's at stake you know and not just the the victim but also uh, the family member or somebody who they they get that hope and then it ends up being completely wrong mm -hmm. yeah well, just like in the middle of the spiritualist movement, they actually put a law on the books in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, up until the 1980s, that you were not allowed to make any profit or money from prognostication because of the rampant fraud that ran through the Midwest with the spiritualist movement and the camp followers that came along, the con artists. So it wasn't until the 1980s that a spiritualist actually stepped up to the city council and said, hey, you're keeping me from practicing my religion. You can't do this to me. That they finally just said, well, okay. And they repealed it, but that was 1980. Yeah. Um, I don't call myself a medium because I don't always connect with people who have passed. That's not where my messages always come from. I think it's really important to, to remember as a parent that children are especially susceptible to being able to see things, to hear things, because they're still so young and innocent, and they haven't gone through enough of life to be taught that they should be squashing that intuition yet. So it's not unusual for children to say that they're seeing people or hearing people, you know. It is believed that everyone is born with the potential of having gifts. They just blossom and develop in some over others. Choice may play a big role in this as well. Young psychics or sensitives may not have the support they need for developing and handling their gifts. I met a young sensitive who pretty much dealt with her gifts alone. Start from the beginning as early as you can. When did you first realize that you were special? I didn't realize it till a long like time after. I thought it was a bad dream for a long time. But uh, when I lived in West Virginia, we lived in this huge, huge house. And I don't know how they afforded it, but they did. Um, and I remember my sister going downstairs and me not wanting to be alone upstairs. And I was in this little pink chair. And all I remember seeing like blue mist and like going down the stairs, running to get away. And I didn't realize what it was until God, probably I was like 15, what had actually happened. My mom had made comments about the house being haunted. I believe that any young kid, teenager, that thinks that they have this should try to see if they can get, I mean, even going to like Indian powwows, there's a lot of spiritual people there that will teach you and tell you that this is okay to do this. And some people do not like it, and some people do like it, but it depends on the person. This imaginary friend thing quite often is people that they're seeing, and parents just brush it off because they've gotten to the point that they don't believe in that. The advice for parents is just, you know, honestly, that's going to depend on their beliefs. If it's not something that they believe in, then they're going to teach them that it's not normal to hear people, it's not normal to see people. I didn't really understand anything that was happening because neither were imaginary friends. Like, we lived in this uh, red and white trailer, and I had this friend, and she was an older woman, and her name was B. She was probably nine or eight years old. And we were talking to the neighbors. We were over their house. I was eating watermelon or something. And my mom's like, oh, yeah, Patty has this little imaginary friend named B. And the woman went white. She's like, what's she like? And I'm like, oh, she's an old lady with pink curl hair. And she's like, did she used to live in the trailer? I'm like, yeah, she lived in the back room where mom was, but she died of an aneurysm. I mean, I'm nine years old. I don't, don't know what an aneurysm is. Find someone that they can talk to or that the parent can talk to to know how to help the child, even if they don't want the child to directly interact with them. But just to ignore it and pretend there's not a problem, chances are it's not going to go away. I mean, I've, I've seen like teenagers like, oh, I can talk to spirits. I know you can't. You might have a couple bunks in a really old farmhouse, but you have no understanding of you know being watched constantly and those things that scare you know that you know they're there and they can hurt you i mean may not physically but they scare the piss out of me and casey's like well he can do it too i'm like well let's see so talking to you i mean you seem legit and i've watched a few of your videos and you seem exactly know what you're talking about and the things that you can see. My grandmother passed away and my mother had got a phone call earlier that day saying that she was sick. It came out of the blue. And then we were driving somewhere and she got another phone call and I instinctively knew who it was. She died. 
And of course, she had passed away moments ago, and I, as soon as the phone rang, I knew exactly what happened. Same thing with my dad. He died three years ago. We were in Nebraska City, and they were like, oh, we'll take my dad home. He's fine. And I got this really bad gut feeling. I thought everything was fine. And we got a phone call, and, and instinctively, I knew again he, he was dead. And he died of uh, an aneurysm in his stomach. Death is constant, you know, when we're doing this, or going to clients' houses or hear about, you know, stories like that, or, um, you know, some of them are more like, brutal or gory in some aspects, and it makes you think, because some of them, it is like, you're here one minute, and then you're gone the next, and it's just, you can have it makes you, uh, yeah. Do you have an opinion on those who use their psychic abilities to feed off of others' energies? I have luckily never encountered that, really, but I guess I could see how it could happen. I mean, anytime that a psychic is using their power, powers or gift, there's an energy share. And most of the situations that I've been in, it's been a positive thing where we're sharing a positive energy. Energy around me, everything has energy. It's not haunted, but it has energy. And you see it and you feel it. And that's what happens with people. You can tell they're in bad moods or I guess I could see how someone could just send not so positive negative, not so positive energy to someone as well. Like if it's happening all the time, do you know techniques to protect or to kind of close your eye, third eye, so to speak? The only, I mean, I don't have a technique. When it happens, it happens. So there's no shutting it off. I mean, suddenly it was the middle of the night, and I was going up uh, a flight of stairs, and it's the old farmhouse I live in right now. And suddenly, it was the middle of the day. It was beautiful. All the doors were open, the windows were open. It was like spring. I could hear kids laughing, mm -hmm. running past me. And then it was dark again in an instant. And it, it varies from person to person. Like, I think completely shutting down can actually, that can do some bad stuff to yourself. You can completely try to go stone cold, cold turkey on that. And it doesn't work for everybody the same way. We're kind of like snowflakes. What might work for you might not work for me and vice versa. Um, but ways to kind of, it's not completely shutting off completely, but trying to gain a little bit more control over it. So whether it's um, setting boundaries with whatever it is in the environment, I've done that before, to, um, of course, meditation um, practices or to wearing any like stones or crystals and stuff that I have too that are meant for some form of protection or doing St. Michael prayer or any of those kind of things do help too. It's scary, but I don't have anything. I don't want a religion. I don't want to be tied down to something that if this doesn't work, well, what am I going to do? It's, I might not have one, but I think it's better than keeping yourself to one. And what if it's practices doesn't work for you? See, part of that thing that's only concerning to me is that having nothing, but yet you're, you say you're, you're not, Atheist. No. Okay. Thank you for the interview. It was very knowledgeable. Thank you. And I do have a question for you. And it's been one of my, well, not main stress, but it's been stressful for me. Um, and it's about a guy named <laughs> <laughs> So I was just wondering, because he, um, we've dated off and on and I mean, he's lied to me. It's, it's just, there's been negative, but there's also been a lot of positive. Mm -hmm. And, like, as much as I try pushing him out, it just, it, every time we're, like, together, it's like a flood of emotion. I'm just like, ah. We can have connection with, with people in our lives that they've been brought into our lives for a reason. So I do feel like there's a reason that you two have connected and that, that those feelings have manifested, but it feels like there are some lessons that you're supposed to be learning from your relationship with him that you know what those lessons are. <laughs> and I, the way that I can describe it is it's like a, an assignment where you answer the question, you hand it to the teacher, they say, no, it's wrong, do it again. And you do it again, you hand it in and it's wrong. You keep repeating the same cycle and you keep allowing the same things to happen. And the funny thing about it is, they're not things that you're going to accept. You know, they're, but you know deep down in your heart that you're not gonna change him and he's not gonna change on his own. 
you know. So there are those emotions that are there, but really it feels like he was brought into your life more because there was a lesson that you needed to learn. There was, there was a period of growing that you needed to do, and I think that you've seen the growth from the time that you've met him to now, that just kind of a, a blossoming, and you're just holding on to that. And unfortunately, I mean, you really, I mean, once a lesson's learned, it is time to move on to the next one. And don't take anything that I'm going to say as him not caring about you, because I do think that he also has genuine feelings for you. But he's not as serious about it being a, a long-term thing as you are. He's not looking at it as, a, as someone to grow into the future with. He's looking at it as someone to have fun with. I admit, she seemed accurate. The other reason he keeps coming back is because you keep letting him. You know, I mean, it feels like you kind of push him away and and he's getting to, you know, he'll go away for a little bit, but then he wants his cake and eat it too. So he's like, well, I'm just gonna test the waters here. Well, you warm the water up for him, you know, so. Oh, thank, thank you so much. <laughs> While Jackie was testing and sampling Kelly's gifts, I wanted to try an experiment with Patricia. It was meant to see if she could clear out her mind and be open to a specific message. Right here, she has not seen it. I drew, at random, two items and wanted to connect our gifts momentarily at least to see if she could get the message. Okay, we're commencing. Think about the number of objects that I drew. Keep in mind, this doesn't work with everyone. She started well. Two. Focus on the first one primarily first. And think about it. I'm sending it to you now. There's spikes on it. Got a lot of them. Uh, looks like a head. Maybe, maybe a dinosaur, like a little cartoon dinosaur. Well, let's focus on colors. Let me see. Earth colors, like cool colors, kind of green. Any other colors? I want to say yellow, but I'm not sure. We did have a stronger connection at first, but it weakened and couldn't reconnect right away. No, actually all I, all I have is like this too. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the strongest, I had asked an observer what she thought. The first object it was around maybe a 3 because she got the colors. But the second object she was I had no clue what that was. I couldn't see a damn thing. What was the first object then? Let's put it this way. You're right on the number of objects. You got that one dead on. The color you got right, the spiky things were through here. See, I kept seeing spikes. I didn't see anything else. Yeah, the spiky things are through there. All right, well, thank you for your time. And uh, now that you know somebody else who, you know, we can share experiences with or whatnot, that's great. So thank you for your time. What are some examples of protection psychics and others can use on their path? Hi, I'm Lenore Hamill, uh, owner of Morning Light Bookstore. We're located in Windsor Heights, Iowa. Uh, welcome. Uh, this business was started over 13 years ago uh, by um, a group of women down on uh, Ingersoll Avenue in Des Moines and in 2000 I became the caretaker of Morning Light Bookstore and in 2001 I moved it here to Windsor Heights, Iowa. We are what I call a center for conscious living and um, the items that we have here are all tools to help people on their spiritual path. So to become conscious of their own higher self, their connection to their, their soul and their spirit. And um, the items that we have here are intended to help people do that. And we focus more on relaxation music, um, the connection with the rocks, working with our chakra energies, and, our and have a lot of classes. What might be some common methods or procedures offered here for protection? This, everything is energy. So as an astrologer, I've known that 
for many, many years. So it's real important for us to keep our own energy clear because all we are is vibrating energy. Um, we're constantly bumping up to and interacting with energies of all kinds in other people's energy systems. So it's important for us to clear our own energy, but also to keep the energy clear in the spaces that are important to us, like our, our workspace, our home, our car, that type of thing. Um, different rocks and different minerals and in understanding that the mineral kingdom is another level of vibrating consciousness. Um, there are certain um, stones, such as crystals, that can be used to keep the frequency or the vibration of a particular uh, place um, raised to a higher level. And why, where I would use a quartz cluster like this, if I had a space where I needed the energy to be raised, I needed the frequency to be more clear, to be more, um, to um, have a better feel to it, I would use something like a cluster because the energy with quartz, the direction of the energy comes through the points. And with a cluster, we have the points all, um, the energy actually shooting out in different directions. So it provides like a, a wire, wider, positive energy in a space. Do you feel it's important for anybody, especially getting in in the field of paranormal and metaphysical, is dealing with spirit, to be aware of methods of protection? You know, I would say people learn the hard way. So usually it's the first time someone's gone and they're saying, oh, I'm going to go, you know, uh, go do some ghost hunting or I'm going to do some space clearing. And all of a sudden they feel this heavy attached energy when they go home or they start to feel sad or angry and they're like, this isn't me, why do I feel this way? And what's happened is they've taken something home with them. And it's usually at that point that they consult someone like yourself or me and says, oh, what is this? I don't know what it is. So yes, foreknowledge is good. Um, learning how to protect yourself and to keep your aura, your aura, with no attachments to it is really an important thing. And beware, there might be some unwanted energy that follows one home, whether it's an unsuspected item at a garage sale or some negative residue left behind by somebody. Since my children were little, I've, they, they remember the stories that when we go to garage sales or you go to antiquing, you need to be careful of what you're taking home with you because the energy imprint, whether good or bad, of the people that own those items is, can still be with them. I find myself that different people use different methods of clearing. Mine is intent. I set the intent with an object that this is now part of what I'm going to use in the future. This is now part of my home. And wherever the energy was in the past, thank you for where it was, but this is where it's going to be now. Other people use tools, they use rituals, they use sage, some people use incense. Um, this is a, this would be a little, sound is a great healer. So this little uh, device here, this little tuning device can be used to clear the energy in a space. Yeah, sage is something, these are what are called smudge sticks and Someone, and a lot of times we'll have people, we have a lot of people that will come in here and use these and say, my apartment doesn't feel good, or I just had friends over and I didn't like the energy that was left. And what they'll do is they will light the sage stick, set the intent that they're clearing the space, and then with the smoke, use a feather or their hand and walk around the space and kind of fill it with the, with the smoke of the sage. And this, comes, this dates back to Native American and pagan days where they used this method of, of cleansing. And that's what I was going to get to, too, is that for Native American beliefs on this, to keep it as pure as possible, keep it in earthly storage, so to speak. So like this, why, you know, yarn or, or cotton is wrapped around them right. um, signifies part of that. Using a shell and a feather yes. is another part of it. Yes, that. and so like abalone shells are the most popular form of this right now. And you can get the sage, which we've just taken right off the sticks. It comes in pound bags and then just bundling it and using, using a shell uh, to, uh, 
for your burning ceremony. There are those that believe that natural herbs in medicines in the wild can actually be more beneficial than pharmaceutical medications you get at a drugstore. And there's also those that uh, use natural healing like Reiki. There are different modalities of healing that people can use to um, clear their aura but also to um, um, help clear their physical selves. Like I said, we're vibrating energy. So what we're doing is we're bringing energy in from source, energy in from universal energy to help heal our cells, to heal our emotions, to heal our thoughts, and different modalities such as Reiki, Theta healing, and being brought back from ancient times so that we can remember to be self-healing, that we can be responsible for ourselves. We just had an amazing experience. It was, it was three weeks ago here at the store. We, um, I have different healers who find out about us, and so as part of their journey around the United States, they call and they ask if they can stop and spend a few days here, especially if they're guided to. And we had a shamanic healer. She was originally from Panama, lives in New York, and she was just here for, for well, I think she was here for four days, her first trip, and she was completely booked. Um, she did healing sessions on people. And she used a lot of different modalities. She worked with angels, she worked with uh, mantras, but the bottom line was, her work was amazing. Um, I had a personal experience with it, which uh, pretty much amazed me. I'm very practical on, on top of all that I do. Um, and um, I levitated. So that was a new one for me. And um, I did get a very big clearing. I still work in both worlds. So um, I've been an astrologer for almost 40 years now. So I, I know the other side. I've met good psychics, I've met good mediums, I've worked with them, I've worked with really good healers. So I know that all to be true. Um, the other part of it is I find that everyone finds their own path to their own soul, their own spirit. So if someone is deeply religious, I'm very, I try to frame things in a language which is not offensive. So um, if I find that talking astrology is going to step on their toes, I don't use that conversation. You mentioned it doesn't matter if you're, uh, you know, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, you know, believe in Buddha, believe in the gnome in your front yard, as I say too sometimes. This activity or negative energy is really universal and it could happen to anybody. Maybe, you know, if they simplify it as energy, good energy, I just need good energy, where can I go? And this yeah. is a place like that. And, and you know, I think you're right about that. I think you're finding there's a common denominator when we talk energy, when we talk uh, vibrational frequency, it takes it almost to a science level, which takes the fear out of it and doesn't put it into other categories. Like attracts like. So the key is keeping your own frequency and your own vibrational uh, being as high as it can be and focusing on things like goodness, goodwill, harmlessness, you know, um, focusing on divine qualities um, that can keep your energy high. Right. And also when you hang out a lot of the time, whether your work is in hospice or, you know, giving last rites to somebody, stuff like that, that really is a lot of that energy that really takes a toll social on workers yes you know you have a lot of social workers that come in here mm -hmm. and they're like oh you know mm -hmm. I just need something to, to help with my energy and get it yeah. raise it up yeah thanks again for your all right time. thanks yeah I'll stop in again sometime okay all right. okay we're exhibition apparition and we're making a documentary this summer about our experiences so. well, we're making one right now right now <laughs> we're making a documentary within a documentary Jennifer Schaefer, and I'm from Baxter, and I'm with Abnormal Paranormal. And how many times have you been to this building? Four. I've been here four times. Our focus has been around this, but with paranormal shows and movies appearing left and right into our culture, what do some independent video makers think? I'm Tyler Krozak. I'm from Elmhurst, Illinois. That's right outside Chicago. And I like film, music, movies. Paranormal-wise, when I got into the business, I, I grew up listening, I've been hearing about it. My aunt lived in a haunted house. I always loved hearing about the stories. But yeah, that's, and then I got into paranormal investigating. Um, I'm Joe Boyd, I'm 18. I'm from Elmhurst, Illinois as well. Um, 
Basically, I've been into the paranormal since I was little. My mom grew up in a haunted house. Does taping footage in haunted places make these folks more likely to be believers? I wasn't until last week, to be honest. We were, I, was, I wasn't a disbeliever, I was just a skeptic for the right reasons. And I like to have a skeptic mindset about it because I mean, if you're just naive and you believe in it, then you're gonna look for every reason to believe in it. After what happened at the Sedum's Directory, with him getting scratched on three separate occasions. So yeah, now I'm starting to get pushed over towards the believer side. But I mean, that's the only, that's the whole reason why I do this. I don't do it because like for fame, for money, obviously that doesn't really come with it. I just 100% believe, I mean, I've, I've been scratched, I've been pushed. I guess my question is, do you, do you think you guys are um, grounded or prepared for all the different types of activity? Yes. Man, we protect ourselves, we have other people protect ourselves, wish us luck, and they, they pray for us on our investigations. Especially after last week, we're very careful. Yeah, after la last week was intense. We had multiple people saying protection prayers for us. We probably said protection about four or five times at the Sedum's Rectory, and whatever, it just kept happening. Just this, you know, the attacks. Yeah, we basically had to learn this the hard way, though. Mm -hmm. We weren't, like, when we started, we didn't know. Oh, we didn't protect ourselves for crap. We walk into places, you know, no matter good, bad, whatever they are, you don't want it in your house. Even camera guys and gals can take unwanted visitors home with them, even if they are just bystanders. You can be in these, you can be in these haunted places, and then you can be cool, like there's ghosts all around me. But once you're out of this place and you're at home, you don't want that. You don't want that following well, you around. Well, That's a whole lot of stuff. It'd be yeah. on their time. Right? It's on their. Yeah, you're basically you're coming in here yeah. for your own good, but them following you back at home is just past your comfort level. You want to be safe at your own house. Uh -huh. You don't want to have to worry about it. You want to have, I mean, your investigation time, and then you want your own time. You know. Yep. Uh, what do you think drives you to join the ranks of paranormal and cinema, like merging the two together? What What's your goals, I guess, with these documentaries? Well, the par it's kind of funny because he's the paranormal, like I'm the cinema. We we went to we grew up together. We went to different high schools, but I like we were we weren't even that big of friends in middle school. And then once high school came around, we decided to make this. It's brought like brought us together as friends. And I'm really into movies. I'm really into films. I'm cool. Really get into like the cool film stuff. The cameras like. He's really into the paranormal, and I think that once him and I merged together and did it, we both started to get a we started to get a liking towards like I like the paranormal, but I always thought this was like something I didn't want to do for a while. Exhibition apparition was meant to be. Yeah. Being in the video and movie business, do these young men think that the growth of the paranormal shows and movies have damaged the field at all? Yes. Yes. Well, yes and no. I mean. The fact that so many paranormal groups are being started now because of TV, I think is a good thing. I mean, but the problem is, is that the people who get themselves involved with that, I'm not saying this is with everyone, but I mean, evidence-wise, whether it's real or not, but they don't, I don't think they, they stress enough of, you need to like respect, you know what I mean? You gotta learn how to people, you gotta learn how to respect the spirits, gotta learn how, you're coming in to their place, it's like going to these people's houses. You gotta not bring Ouija boards. Perfect, the 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 right methods. I just think it's being being shown a different way than what it should be shown. Yeah, and they all focus on consequences and stuff. Yeah. Which is exactly which is they the don't understand how serious. Which is the problem with TV is that people get the wrong idea from it. Well, just for like for example, I was at Ashmore Estates like three weeks ago, and the night I was there, the Ghost Ventures episode of Ashmore Estates was on. And a car full of like drunk kids just showed up and tried like coming in. They were just like shouting at the spirits, and I mean, yeah. it's just people think that that's what you do, and like I don't know. Yeah, the wrong people getting into it for the wrong reasons. There's there's also the right people though. Yeah. Also, I feel like it's open. It did it for us too. I mean, we didn't. Do, I didn't like if none of these ghost shows were on TV. Shit, I wouldn't be doing this. Like, like it's just like it was a curiosity, but it was also seeing the stuff on TV that really pushed us to be like. See, the people, like in our case and other people's cases who started paranormal investigating, come and respect the spirits, they pay their money to investigate, and they don't fake evidence. Like, those people, most of those people came from watching it on TV. For the paranormal community, there's been a lot of people, there's a lot of people who like to mimic other people's styles, but like in a bad way. Like, I see a lot of ghost adventure wannabe people, and like, you know what I mean? Like, just here, there, here, there, and it's just like, I feel like sometimes I'll go on YouTube and see watch people's paranormal videos and I'd be like, wow, that guy's yeah. trying to be Zach Bagan. It just feels like the standard now is like this. 
wearing tight cap out yeah. shirts and the hat and walking in all like. But it, mm-hmm. no matter what industry you get yourself into, yeah. no matter what industry you get yourself into, there's gonna be those people. I mean, like, yeah. say you want to be a people walk around looking like Elvis because they want to be exactly like Elvis. Like, what do my fellow colleagues suggest if you might be thinking about videography and the paranormal? Get your own style. I mean, find your own style, something that's unique. I mean, spend the money. I mean, do your research. Do your research. Be careful. Spend your money wisely. You have to be like, you yeah. can't just like be a filmmaker and want to be a paranormal filmmaker. I mean, you have to have knowledge and you, yeah. you, you can't just jump into it like you have to have experience. No, exactly. Like I've, I, I've had, I do other stuff other than our paranormal videos, like music videos, short films. I'm working on a feature length to get with like um, guy who goes to Columbia in the city. So, I mean, that's just, I mean, it's just like you gotta, you, you can't just rely on the paranormal. Because the problem with that is that sometimes when it comes to filmmaking, during the winter, him and I, during the school year, we don't we don't really investigate just because like free time, buy nice cameras, buy nice ghost hunting equipment, and get a job. I mean, that's Do like research. Yep. Do research. Yep. Good advice. All right. Well, I've always heard that given the time of year, the hour in the day or night, that activity, paranormal activity, can be heightened. I have noticed trends out there different times of the year, day, night, you know, um, the veil is the thinnest between the living and the dead, and so communication um, with the other side may be more likely. Test it ourselves. What do you think? I would be 100% for it. I think it would be a very good experience. We headed back to Farrar and chose the summer solstice super moon to experiment with. Here with Jackie, and she's been working on uh, doing some reporting for this project as well. And this is a moment where we actually get to uh, do some field research and get away a little bit from the um, interrogating and <laughs> you know interviews that we've that we've done. Um, what are your thoughts? So far? Um, this will be my second time here. So last time we got in. AVP, but unfortunately, didn't catch it on any recordings. See about that guy in the boiler room. Yeah, yeah, we'll see if he comes yeah. out. And then also we have a super moon tonight. Um, there's been that influence as well, paranormal activity. Um, the moon, just like water. And there's kind of an interesting correlation there. Uh, the moon can affect tides and water, and then water, in fact, can also affect paranormal activity. So they all kind of play off each other like a family there. We're about to go in there now, start our first session. We have on clockwork here. We're going to start in the lower level, the gym, and the boiler room level. And we're going to work our way up through the night. So, all right, you ready? Yep. Going to, what we're doing is we're doing our baseline sweeps here. We're going to have our K2, we're doing some EMF sweeps. We're going to go ahead and do the uh, thermometer and temperature sweeps. 70.8 to 71. Any K2 hits yet? Other than the logical? Not really a whole lot either. Okay, we had a K2 hit just after our sweep where it's gone all the way to red. If that was you that triggered that device all the way to the red, are you able to step right there again and do it again? Just to let us know, do you like Jackie back there, or do you like Jackie at all? Possible intelligent interaction started fairly quickly in the boiler room. I'm getting chills a little bit. Noise from back there. Is that you? Is that a, that's, there you, that's better. Part of our goal tonight is to try to figure out who's happy and who's not happy. It just would be nice to get that confirmation or that, that yes, that answer in a different way. <laughs> yeah, I know, I kind of, it's like, what more do you want from me? <laughs> Thank you. Start this fresh with my next question. Just, thank you. Just, I was going to say, make, all, make sure all the lights are off and I'll continue with the next question here. Was that man originally with the school, or did he come in later? Was he brought in by somebody? No? 
So he was always at the school? Was he a, a principal? Ooh. As I'm talking about him, I notice the mood is changing a little bit. So the teacher, can you come back? Thanks, thank you. You don't like us talking about him, do you? Because he knows when we're talking about him and he comes down or he comes out, doesn't he? That's what I thought. All right, uh, do you want him gone? Oof. <laughs> I got a little chill there too. All right, step away, step away, just a moment, step away. Let the lights calm down. Step away. So you like Jim and Nancy. They're the current owners of this building. Yeah, ooh, all the way to red. And the motion light. And the motion light. Good, good. Do you like me? Do you like me here? Yes? We moved out into the gymnasium area and the intelligent energy possibly followed us. Are you still here? Is that you? But only a couple more interactions occurred and we moved to the next floor. 80 to 81.5 degrees is our average. After we did our EMF and temperature sweep, we instantly started experiencing activity. Earlier we were doing some K2 hits in here, was that you? Did you hear something again? Dude, that was loud. The interceptor is going, so hopefully we got it. This is Spirit Interceptor, and this is what we use in our, um, our Paranormal Endeavor series that we do in chapters. Um, it's a device that has a bunch of equipment that can be attached to it. Um, it can be customized. It can have EMF meters on there, but you have to be careful because sometimes it emits EMF, so it's... Not really getting a whole lot in here. Not getting a whole lot in here? Me neither, really. The activity was brief, so we moved to our last floor. Oh, was that? Was that was a cry. It sounded like it came down. Where did it sound like it came from? Down here. Down here? It started down there somewhere. Yeah, because I, I caught the reverb sounded like it came down by you guys. Jackie wants children someday. She likes kids. Ooh. It's something knocked in here. Well, when I have kids someday, I want a little girl and a little boy. You can come out. You don't have to be scared. Dude, I heard that. That sounded like a... The... Yeah. It, like... was right, it, was, it was behind me. Ocean light, but that could have been you moving. Uh, noises over here. As we're talking about the man, the activity is increasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa! What was that? Dude, did you guys hear that? What was your experience, Mike? Dude, something was walking in here on yeah. that wood floor. You heard footsteps? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll go with you. Dude. What? Did you hear that? It was right there. It's like a chair move. <laughs> This out, did the chair it move? It was like right behind me. Right. Like it sounded like something was like. Dude, what? There's freaking walking in here, man. Again? That was loud. This floor is usually very active and it seemed to be this night. It's like a hand right here. Whoa! What was that? Did you hear that? I heard that. Child? Or something that sounded... What? What in the hell was that? Whoa. Dude! So... There ain't no way. <gasps> oh my gosh! This freaking window opened by itself, dude. Because it was closed earlier, right? They're all closed. They were all closed. Dude! That's what that noise that. was. You saw that, right? It bumped out. Hey, 
Okay, so with the summer solstice, it's now technically because we crossed midnight, so it's now June 22nd, but um, during the time that we were here and the moon being um, as full and as close as it is, how would you rank, and we still have the evidence to go over, but how would you think tonight went? Um, we definitely had a lot more activity tonight, I feel, and from my own experiences than the last time I was here. Wish them good night and for our good night and thanks again for helping me on this endeavor. <laughs> we had a lot of personal experiences and slightly more evidence in previous investigations, but it's inconclusive in regards to the outside influences. There is so much to learn in this field. The metaphysical world contains more than what was covered in these series of reports. The bottom line is, research it before getting into the field, have knowledge and utilize protective measures, and network so you're not alone because you never know when you may need to reach out to someone for help.